Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we can meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Brattersine, whichever you prefer. And today we're doing something a little bit different. Today we're doing sort of a true crime marathon. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure Please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. All right, let's go ahead and get into this video. Now, this is a video that I've wanted to do for a while, because you may not know this, or you may know this, depending on if you watch my bonus videos, but I really love the channel Good Mythical Morning. That is, like, my comfort show. And last year, I believe it was last year, they released a series of compilation videos, and those have become some of my most watched videos from them. Basically what they are are hours long compilation videos where they took some of their like videos and edited them together so that you can just put them on. And that's something that I do. I pick one, I put it on and I just have it playing in the background of my life because I don't know if it's just me. I don't think it's just me. Otherwise I wouldn't be doing this video right now, but I think that some of you probably share this quality with me where I personally have an issue with silence. That's the best way I can put it. So what I will do in my life throughout the day is I will pick like the longest video from my comfort YouTuber or a podcast and I will put it on and just have it playing in the background of my life pretty much all day long. With that said, I know for some of you, I am your comfort YouTuber, which I will never understand. It's not me trying to be like humble or whatever. I just honestly don't get it. I literally as a girl just sitting on my floor filming YouTube videos in front of my couch, but you guys have told me that I am. And so many of you said that you watch every video I put out, which thank you for that. But with all of that in mind, all that I've said, I've decided to create some compilation videos that I'm going to upload from time to time. So if you are one of those people who has an issue with silence or you just want more of me, you can put on like a three hour video of me telling various cases, telling you about various cases and go about your day. So if you like me have an issue with silence, this is for you. And I also realize what week this is coming out on because of, you know, my scheduling that I've done. So if you celebrate Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving. And if you don't, happy week in November, if you're watching this when it came out. And if you're watching this in the future, happy whatever day you're watching this on. Come gather around and let me tell you the story of the tragic murder of 16 year old Lori Show. So I want to start this video off with a quote from Lori Show's mother. Her name's Hazel Whitehead. And she said of her daughter, Lori, and I quote, people say it's time to let Lori rest in peace, but she didn't die peacefully. On the first day of winter, December 20th, 1991, 16 year old Lori Show was murdered in her home. She was stabbed multiple times and her throat was slashed ear to ear. And this poor girl, was found in her own bedroom by her own mother, bleeding heavily, but still alive. So Lori's mother sat down and held her 16 year old daughter as she bled to death. But before she was, before her life was ended, she was able to say the name of the person who murdered her. Sounds pretty open and closed, right? Like it should be pretty easy to catch this person and for this person to be in jail forever, right? Not so simple. Lori Michelle Show was born January 27th, 1975 to her parents, Hazel and John, and she was named for her mother with her mother's middle name being Lori. Lori was the couple's only child and they saw Lori as their little miracle because of the way she came into the world with her umbilical cord wrapped around her neck, ironically similar to the way she would exit this world as well. Lori's parents tried their hardest to make their marriage work when Lori was younger as they were both raised to fix a relationship, not end it, but it was never able to be salvaged. And the two ended up separating. And after that, Lori spent most of her time living with her mother. Lori was a happy kid who loved to swim and loved twirling the baton when she was young and loved playing with her friends at daycare. She was also a pretty fearless and tough kid, often getting herself hurt and breaking her little bones so often that her mother wondered if something was wrong with her, but no, she was just a klutz. She was just a sweet girl, the type of little girl who fell in love with a fish. She had been out fishing and she fell in love with this fish. So instead of cooking it or releasing it back into the wild, she convinced her parents to let her keep it. And they drove it home the two hour drive in a bucket of pond water. And the whole drive, she pet and talked to the fish. If that's not the cutest thing you've ever heard in your life, I really don't know what is. 
as Lori got older, her and her mother, their relationship changed. They went from just being mother and daughter to also being friends, which is something that I think most people hope they'll have with their parents. Um, I know when I was a teenager, me and my mom did not get along at all, but now that we're both adults, we have a much better relationship and that's the road that Lori was going down. Her and her mom had become very, very close about the time that she was murdered. And when she was murdered, she was a 16 year old sophomore at Conestoga, Conestoga. If you're from the area, please tell me how to say that Conestoga Valley High School. And she was a sophomore. I don't know if I said that she was a sophomore and she had dreams of graduating and going to cosmetology school and eventually being a model. And at the time she was killed, she worked at a store called the, the Deb shop, which was a woman's clothing store. And it was at this job where she was ruthlessly and tirelessly harassed by her future murderer, a girl named Lisa Michelle Lambert. Now, 18 year old Lisa Michelle Lambert, who went simply by Michelle, started harassing Lori show in early 1991 after learning that Lori and Michelle's boyfriend, a 20 year old man named Lawrence Yunkin, had gone on a couple of dates while Lawrence and Michelle were on a break. They were on a break. They were on a break. Lori and Lawrence had gone on a couple of dates, but it didn't really go anywhere. And Lori wasn't that into it and ended up calling it off. And Lori actually even told her mother that on the two's last date, Lawrence had date raped her, which is just so fucked up, but she didn't end up reporting it because she didn't want to cause any trouble. She didn't want it to be a whole thing, but news of this still did get back to Michelle. And it was shortly after Lawrence and Lori's last date that Michelle and Lawrence got back together. And when she did learn that Lori and Lawrence had gone on dates while the two were separated, she was fucking pissed. Michelle had dropped out of school as a teenager and had moved out of her parents' house. And this is when she moved in with her boyfriend, Lawrence. The two were living together in a trailer in the woods because romance. And this man, this relationship, this baby was her whole world. And she saw Lori as a threat to that. She was a very jealous person and became increasingly jealous of and obsessed with Lori. She started to harass her verbally, assaulting her, threatening her, even showing up at Lori's work. Like Lori was a sales clerk, as I said, at the Deb shop at the mall. And Michelle would just show up and continuously harass her, never giving her any peace. Michelle even showed up once while Lori, Lori was in the parking lot of her work. She was standing outside with some friends and Michelle and Lawrence drove up, saw Lori. Michelle got out of the car, hit Lori, slammed her head into the trunk of a car before leaving. And after this, Lori was so scared that she started taking like other routes to get home, just doing whatever she could to try to avoid running into Michelle because Michelle was becoming a bit unhinged. And it got so bad that Lori and her mother even went to the police station and filed an assault charge against her, just trying to do whatever they could to deescalate the situation and make it stop because it got to a point where it was just too much. And this assault charge was filed less than a week before Lori was murdered. Witnesses had reported that Michelle had expressed to them that she wanted to quote, scare Lori, then hurt her, then slit her throat. She stalked Lori for months, calling her over and over at home, yelling profanities at both Lori and her mother. She was just becoming like a lot. It was getting to be too much. She seemed to be losing it and blamed Lori for ruining her life and the picture perfect life that she was under the impression that she had created with Lawrence. And it got so bad that Hazel, Lori's mom, even changed the house phone number so that she would just stop calling. Now, the morning of Lori's attack and murder. And yeah, I said morning because this happened bright and early in the morning. Fuck. So, ugh. I mean, not any time of day is horrible, but like in the morning, you're all tired. You're all sluggish. You're barely like just trying to start existing and something like this happens to you. It's so fucked up. But it, anyway, Hazel, her mother was not home. Uh, Hazel had left the, the home that she and Lori shared in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which if you've never been there, I haven't. I read up on it, read up on it a little bit. And it is a really small, safe, little piece of Americana. It was a very quiet and old fashioned sort of town. There was even an Amish community that lived super close by. If that gives you any indication of the innocence there. Well, Hazel was out of the house because she had actually been tricked. She had been tricked by her daughter's murderers to be out of the house that morning. She had gotten a call the day before from someone claiming to be Mrs. Cooper, a guidance counselor at Lori's school. And they said they wanted her to come in the next morning 
bright and early so that they could discuss an issue that Lori was having at school where she had gotten trouble with a boy. When Lori heard about this, when she heard her mother say that she was going to meet about this, Lori was very confused because she's like, what the fuck? That never happened. But her mother was going to go regardless because she's like, really? It, it didn't happen, Lori? I'm sure it didn't happen or whatever. I don't know the relationship. They were friends, but you know, kids lie and girls lie about the, the things they be doing with boys sometimes, you know what I mean? So her mother left. And when she left, Lori was in the bathroom getting ready for school. She left before 7 a.m. So it was like really early and too early for Lori to go with her. She was in the bathroom, blow drying her hair, getting ready for the last day of school before Christmas break. Once Hazel arrived at the school, she found that the guidance counselor was not there and never ended up showing up. And there actually was no record of a meeting being on calendar between this guidance counselor and Hazel. So Hazel waited a little bit just to kind of see if this woman would show up and she never did. So she headed home. When she arrived home, she was intercepted by a neighbor on her way into the house. And the neighbor was kind of concerned and was like, I was just wondering if everything was okay. Cause I heard like a lot of loud noise coming out of your apartment while you were gone just now. And Hazel didn't really freak out. Cause she's like, I have a 16 year old daughter. Everything they do is loud as fuck because teenagers are loud. So she was like, Oh, I'm sure it's fine. It's fine. So she walks to her apartment and that's when she sees that the front door is open. So she goes inside and starts looking for her daughter and starts calling out her name. Hazel first went into the bathroom where Lori had been getting ready when she left, but she found that Lori was not there. So she moved on to Lori's bedroom. And this is where she found her 16 year old child in terrible shape. She was laying on the floor in a puddle of her own blood. And as her mom looked closer, she saw that Lori had a rope wrapped around her neck. So immediately her mom ran to the kitchen and she grabbed a knife. She came back and she like slipped her fingers beneath the rope and pulled it and cut off her daughter's neck. And this is when she found that her daughter was somehow still alive, alive, but brutalized. She had been stabbed in the abdomen with one stab wound puncturing her lung and another that grazed her spine. She had several wounds to her head, several defensive wounds and a five inch gash to her throat. She had been cut ear to ear and it was about an inch deep. Hazel sat on the floor with her daughter, holding her in her lap, trying to quote, hold her together. Those were her mother's exact words. And as Lori laid there in her arms, she said the words to her mother, quote, Michelle did it. And then she said Michelle's name over and over before she started saying, I love you over and over to her mother. She then got to the point where she couldn't, there was no more sound coming out of her. So she was just mouthing the words, I love you until she died. Lori was pronounced dead on the scene and the autopsy report showed that her left carotid artery had been severed. Lori's mother, Hazel said of that moment. And I quote, I would not have made it if I had not been with her when she died. I look at it almost as a gift. I was with her when she passed into the next life. I didn't get that horrible phone call. Uh, it's just so sad, dude. I can't even imagine what that was like. And, and after Lori died, her mother spent a lot of time in Lori's bedroom, even though that's where she was killed. Her mother said that sitting there surrounded by her photos and her teddy bears is where she feels like her daughter is still the most alive to her. Police immediately started to interview people who are friends with Lori and people who are friends with Michelle Lambert, because Hazel had told police what Lori had said, what her dying words were, and had told the police who Michelle was since Hazel was very familiar with Michelle. So police wanted to interview people to find the nature of their relationship or their feud rather. And as they did, the more people they talked to, the more clear of a picture was painted. They found out that Michelle was obsessed. As I said, they found that she was constantly talking about how she wanted to hurt Lori, how she wanted to kill people, kill people not people kill Lori and how she had tried to recruit other people to help her hurt Lori. She was talking to everybody like, would you like to help me hurt the 16 year old child? Because that is my bread and butter. And she had even talked to one friend and asked this friend if she would help her kidnap Lori, drive her out into the middle of nowhere and slit her throat. So with that information, it was a very quick turnaround, like a quick turnaround time for police to make an arrest. They actually went and arrested three people the same day. They arrested 18 year old Lisa Michelle Lambert. They arrested 20 year old Lawrence Yunkin, and they arrested Michelle's friend, 17 year old Tabitha Buck. The three of them had been together at a bowling alley, bowling alley, bowling alley, bowling alley. 
Wow, my brain. Yes, the three were arrested at a local bowling alley. And initially, police didn't even know who Tabitha was. She wasn't on their radar or anything. But when they arrived at the bowling alley and they saw her, she had a big cut across her face. And they were like, how'd you get that cut, little girl? And quickly, Michelle jumped in and was like, oh, she got that cut because earlier today, she and I, me and Miss Tabitha here, we got in a fight with a couple of Latin girls and she got cut in the face during the fight. And the police were like, I fucking doubt it. And all three were brought down to the station for questioning. The assistant district attorney who ended up prosecuting the three in question said of this case, and I quote, I think it was the fact that they were all middle-class youths with no mental illness. People just couldn't expect that this kind of thing could happen to that kind of people. I don't know about you, but I cannot say the word youths without thinking of Schmidt from New Girl. Youths, when they steal his tires when he's 29, you know what I mean? No, it's okay, it's fine, it's fine. So, the three were separated so that they could be interviewed individually. And almost immediately, Lawrence was like, word vomit everywhere. He told them everything. He's like, listen, <laughs> listen, I had no idea they were gonna do that. I, I knew they were going to Lori's house, but I thought it was all a prank. I thought they brought the knife, because they brought a knife. I thought they brought the knife to cut Lori's hair off as a prank, because that's the impression I was under. I did not know they were gonna, like what they did, that I wasn't part of that. I dropped them off. I took Michelle the night before so that she can get items for the prank. She got a ski mask, she got rope, she got gloves, but it was all for a prank. Then I took them over in the morning. I dropped them off so that they could cut off her hair. I drove to McDonald's, ate a little food, came back 15 minutes later to meet them in the woods after they were done with the prank. And police were like, right. He said when he met the girls in the woods, they were covered in blood and had a weird smell to them. So he took them back to his trailer so that they could take showers and clean themselves up since they were covered in blood and smelled weird. And then they dropped Tabitha off at school because she was still 17 years old and had high school. He said that he and Michelle then proceeded to dispose of the evidence. He said that they washed the clothes that the girls had been wearing, and then they disposed of these clothes behind a Kmart in a trash bag, and that they then took the murder weapon, the knife, and a pair of bloody shoes and threw them in a nearby river. He tells police that when he asked Michelle, like, what the fuck, what happened, that Michelle told him that she had accidentally stabbed Lori in the back, like, oops, whoops, I slipped, stabbed her in the back, didn't mean to do it. And after doing that, she was like, well, I then slit her throat to put her out of her misery because she was in so much pain. I couldn't leave her like that. Sure. It just makes me so frustrated. <laughs> so police immediately go to that Kmart to try to retrieve the bag of the clothing that had been worn at the time of the murders. And it was easy for them to find it because the clothes were actually in a pink trash bag, which I didn't even know exists. Does that exist? Can I be the extra type of bitch who has pink trash bags? Cause I would love to. Uh, they retrieve the trash bag and it does contain the clothes and they later go to the river and they retrieve the shoes and the murder weapon exactly where Lawrence said they would be. So this confirmed that at least part of his story was true because there was evidence, physical evidence that corroborated what he was saying. When police spoke to Michelle, Michelle's story was very different. Michelle told police that yes, she and Tabitha had been dropped off at Lori's house that morning by Lawrence. But that was pretty much the only thing they did together was arrive together because she quickly turned on her friend Tabitha and said that Tabitha did everything. Tabitha had attacked Lori. Tabitha had killed Lori. Was it Michelle's idea to go to Lori's house? Yes, but that's because Michelle had had a change of heart. Had she stalked Lori for months? Had she harassed Lori for months? Had she beaten and abused Lori for months? Yes, but now she was over it water under the bridge and she wanted to go in person to let Lori know this. But as soon as they had gotten there, Tabitha just wasn't having it, okay? Tabitha and her knocked on the door. As soon as Lori opened the door, Tabitha pushed her way in and immediately started attacking Lori, fighting Lori. The fight ended up spilling into Lori's bedroom where Lori tried to grab for the phone, but Tabitha knocked it right out of her hands and wouldn't allow her to call for help. And then Tabitha started aggressively stabbing Lori and Michelle and her weak constitution couldn't handle it and ran out of the room and never saw how things were, like played themselves out. This is Michelle's story. <laughs> now Tabitha didn't tell police shit because she had spoken to an attorney and was advised not to talk, which is the smart thing to do. Um, I'm not trying to tell you how to get away with murder, but always get an attorney, always get an attorney. Even if you're innocent, get an attorney, especially if you're innocent, get an attorney. But Tabitha had spoken to an attorney and the attorney was like, don't say 
shit, so she didn't. So with that, both Tabitha and Michelle were arrested and charged with first degree murder. Lawrence was not because they couldn't prove that Lawrence was there. They couldn't place him at the crime scene. Nobody's stories, nobody's story was implicating him as being at the crime scene. So he actually cut a deal with the prosecution, whoever you cut deals with, where he would testify against both girls and in exchange he would get a lighter sentence. Lori show was buried two days before Christmas and in her hands, she was holding a photo of her friends and classmates. And apparently 600 of her friends and classmates showed up and waited to say their goodbyes, goodbyes to her in the cold pouring rain because she was that loved. On March 19th, 1992, Lisa Michelle Lambert gave birth to a baby girl in prison. Cause you remember she, during this time, she was pregnant with Lawrence's baby. She gave birth to a baby girl named Kristen and Kristen was then taken from her and put into the custody of her parents since both of this baby's parents were in jail. Lawrence and Michelle were both in jail. So the baby was being raised by Michelle's parents. So Michelle Lambert decided to do something that we don't see very often in these cases. Well, I don't know, maybe you fucking see it all the time. I don't see it very often when I cover these cases. And that's that she waived her right to a jury trial and decided instead to have her fate decided by one lone judge, which again, something I don't see very much. So I thought it was interesting. <sighs> this baby is hugging my lungs. I think, I don't know what he's doing in there, man. He's huge. The prosecution told the judge that Michelle Lambert was a dangerous woman, that she had stalked and tormented and harassed and hurt Lori show 16 year old Lori show for months because she saw Lori as a perceived threat to her relationship with Lawrence. She had told people over and over that she wanted to hurt Lori, that she wanted to kill Lori specifically, that she wanted to cut Lori's throat, that she would do anything to get rid of her to protect her relationship and her family, which is so stupid because Lori didn't even want Lawrence, but what the fuck ever. Michelle was stupid. And Michelle, when she was questioned, pretty much agreed to everything. She said that she did want to hurt Lori and she did see Lori as a threat, but that she never said she wanted to kill her. And she definitely never said she wanted to cut her throat. Another thing that Michelle did that not a ton of people do is she took the stand in her own defense. And it was at this point that she changed her story again. She said that it wasn't Tabitha and her who had went and killed Lori. It was actually Tabitha and Lawrence who would kill Lori. So stick with me here. She said that she did go to the house with Tabitha initially, and they did go in together because they were planning to cut off Lori's hair. Now they're planning to cut off Lori's hair. So she's not just saying water under the bridge. We're cool. Now they're going to do a prank and cut off Lori's hair. <sighs> so they go in together. Tabitha goes crazy, starts stabbing her. As I said, she runs out of the house. Like I said, now, now she's saying that when she ran out of the house, she ran into Lawrence, her now very abusive and very controlling boyfriend who then told her to like sit down and shut up, which she did because she always does what Lawrence says, because he is the boss and that he then went into the house and helped Tabitha finish the job. Now, this didn't really match witness testimonies though, because neighbors at the apartment complex said that at the time of the murders, they had seen two short women leaving the home, which were presumably Tabitha and Michelle who were close to the same height and not Tabitha and Lawrence who were not. Michelle said during her trial that she initially covered for Lawrence because one, she loved him two, he controlled her and three, she really believed that the whole thing was an accident. Don't know how she could considering the story she told, but sure. And she was now at a point where she could no longer defend this horrible man because she no longer believed that this was an accident. And now she did have a little bit of evidence to kind of back up the theory that Lawrence had actually done it. And it was interesting because apparently Michelle wrote Lawrence a letter while they were both in prison. And in this letter, she wrote him a series of questions. I believe this, that was called the, the 29 questions document. And in one of these questions was odd. A lot of these questions were odd and his answers were odd to be honest. And one of the questions was like, are you sure that if I take the fall for you, like I'm going to get less time. And he wrote back with, Yes, which is very strange if he wasn't involved. Like, why would he even say that? And apparently a handwriting expert did look into it and it did appear that these were actually Lawrence's answers, that he did write her back with the answers in his handwriting. And honestly, that's like the one thing that makes me go, hmm, that's kind of interesting. Not interesting enough for me to believe that Michelle didn't do it, 
but definitely makes me look at Lawrence a little, a little harder. During the trial, there was physical evidence submitted that made Michelle look innocent, but also some that made Michelle look guilty. Uh, the thing that made her look guilty was the clothing that had been found um, behind the Kmart. There was a pair of sweatpants in there that belonged to Michelle that were covered in Lori's blood, even though they had washed it, like you can't get rid of all the blood. And they were like, see, she wore these at the time of the murder. And, and they tried to say that these pants belonged to Lawrence at one point, but they had Lawrence like hold them up in front of them. And they were like several inches too short for his legs. So they're like, nice try, but clearly no. But the thing that made her not look guilty is a letter that she had written to Lawrence in prison where she wrote to him and saying, and I quote, I know I'm not an angel, but Lawrence, I never got mad enough to kill. In the end, Lisa Michelle Lambert was found guilty of first degree murder and conspiracy, and she was given life in prison without the possibility of parole as opposed to the death penalty because the judge figured due to her age and her lack of criminal record, she would be more useful to the world if she was still alive. Tabitha's trial started two months later and her attorneys filed a petition for her to be tried as a juvenile. And if it was successful, it would have taken the death penalty off the table. And also she could have gotten out in as little as four years years. And her attorneys basically said that the reason she should be tried as a juvenile is because one, she was 17 years old at the time of the murders, which technically is a juvenile. And two, she had no criminal record and she was young enough that she could be put into a program where she could be rehabilitated during her time in prison and be rehabilitated and be a better person in society as opposed to just put throwing her in jail forever with no key. Wow. That was a good sentence. Hey, -oh. in the end, her attorneys actually ended up withdrawing this petition because the prosecution agreed to take the death penalty off the table. And they thought that they'd have a pretty good chance of getting a good deal there, but it didn't quite go that way because after three hours of deliberation, Tabitha was found guilty of second degree murder and given life in prison without the possibility of parole. As Tabitha was led from the courthouse after being, you know, found guilty, her mother, who was watching, was just crying hysterically, obviously, because um, she's losing her daughter too, obviously not in the same way, but it, it's not a fun time for anyone. And Hazel, uh, Lori's mother, even said of this, and I quote, that's a mother and family sitting in there that loves their daughter just as much as I loved mine. It's not a happy day for any of us. Now, to fast forward here uh, quite a bit, actually, for Tabitha, in 2012, a decision was made by the U.S. Supreme Court where they deemed that life sentences against juvenile offenders were unconstitutional. This made it possible for Tabitha to get a new hearing to be resentenced, and it could also make her eligible for parole. So Tabitha was resentenced, and she was subsequently given 28 years to life. And since at the time this happened, she had already served 26 of those years, she became eligible for parole in 2019 or 2020. And she did end up being released. She was released, um, obviously, with conditions, as they always have. Uh, the conditions where she was not allowed to contact Lori's family at all. She wasn't allowed to drive through, reside in, visit, like stay away from Lancaster County. You're not welcome here. She's not allowed to go there. And she has to take psychiatric medication. The Lancaster County DA's office released a statement regarding Tabitha's release. And that statement was, and I quote, the resentencing of juvenile murderers has been one of the most difficult and gut-wrenching tasks we have ever had to handle. Our system told victims' families their case was over, and in many cases, for decades. The courts ruled and we follow the law, but that in no way diminishes the added emotional trauma this process has caused to those who have already suffered. Most of all, we must remember the innocent victims whose lives were taken have no ability to appeal or receive a new sentence. Lori's mother read a statement and said to Tabitha directly, and I quote, Lori died a horrible death for reasons that I will never understand. Why did you agree to come to our house that morning? Now, Lawrence. Lawrence, remember, he had made a deal with the prosecution. Well, apparently he lied about something and he got his deal taken away from him. So he ended up having to plead no contest to third degree murder and he got 10 to 20 years in prison. And I could not figure out what he lied about, but I want to know what he lied about because there's so much like weirdness for me around Lawrence. And I want to know what he lied about, but I couldn't figure that out. I found a lot out, but I couldn't figure that out. So now let's fast forward a bit for Lawrence when Lawrence was released because 
spoiler alert, Lawrence was released by now. He was only 32 years old and had only served 12 years for his part in the crime, which was, quote, driving the getaway car for Michelle and Tabitha. This was the third time that Lawrence had applied for parole or attempted to get paroled. Um, and he was finally, you know, it was granted. And Hazel was very disappointed with their decision to let him out. Lawrence's probation ended on the 20th anniversary of Lori's death. And apparently Lawrence was ordered to pay Lori's family the sum of $12,000, a whopping $12,000 in restitution. But the last report I saw said he still owed a great deal of that and that the family would just get random payments here and there. After the murder, Lori's mother, Hazel, spent about a year gathering signatures for a petition to have legislation passed to have stronger anti-stalking laws added to her area. And from her work, Pennsylvania did just that. Legislation was signed into effect in 1993 that outlawed stalking. And she said of this quote, Lori was my life. I had to do something. And man, that really does sound like it should be the end of the story, right? Like, uh, all have been arrested. Some have been released. We know who did it. Seems pretty clear, but look at how much time's left of this video. We're not even almost done. Well, we might be, we're kind of almost done, but we're not done yet. There's still so much to go because shit's about to go down. Michelle Lambert filed many appeals during her time in captivity. And one was finally successful when it passed by a judge, when it was recognized by a judge in Philadelphia, where she was born and raised. No. This was in 1996 when she wrote a letter to this federal judge, essentially stating that she was being unjustly held in prison that she was innocent and that she had proof. She cited 29 documents where Lawrence had essentially taken responsibility for the murder and where she had written to him that she was covering for him. Michelle ended up getting an attorney and the attorney believed that she was railroaded also. She believed that it was crazy that Lawrence had gotten such a sweet deal when there was just as much implicating him, just as much evidence implicating him as there was Michelle. And according to this attorney, Lawrence had even told a coworker the day before the murders that he was never coming back to work because he was going to murder a girl and get arrested for it. Her new attorneys also presented information that suggested that Michelle was a woman suffering from battered woman's syndrome, battered woman's syndrome, that Lawrence was a very abusive man and that Michelle did whatever she could to make Lawrence happy because that's what she was conditioned to do. And that's why she had taken the fall for him in the first place. They said that Lawrence was very abusive and she cited him many, many times that Lawrence had beaten her or raped her. And in addition to that, in addition to that, she told her, she, what? <laughs> in addition to that, Michelle and her attorney were now saying that six months prior to the murder, Michelle had been gang raped by, I believe it was three police officers and that Michelle being arrested and the evidence pointing to Michelle as the murderer was part of an elaborate, um, conspiracy to frame her for these officers to protect themselves from what they had done to her. So Michelle ended up being granted a new hearing. And at that time, her new attorneys found a ton of things that were wrong and like unconstitutional in her initial trial, because they were now given access to everything. And they found that there was a ton of evidence that made Michelle look better. Like it was more favorable for her, but the police and the prosecution did not give that over to the defense during the discovery process. And that's like a big no, no. Again, during this new hearing, um, Michelle and her attorney said that it wasn't Michelle who was guilty, that it was actually Tabitha and Lawrence who had committed the crime and that she was being framed. And she said that she had only initially admitted to being part of it at all because Lawrence was an abusive man and that she did whatever Lawrence said. By this time, Michelle had started going by Lisa and she had grown out her hair dark and she had just totally tried to reinvent herself um, as this innocent, unjustly held woman who was just trying to do what she could to protect her abuser and her baby. And what sucks is that Lori Show's mother Hazel even ended up actually giving a little bit of information at this hearing that was favorable. She didn't mean to, it wasn't what she was trying to do, but she actually did testify that she saw Lawrence Youngkin near her home the day of the murder. And this helped put the idea in the judge's mind that it could have been Lawrence. Like they were, she was saying it was Lawrence and now Lori's mom was saying that Lawrence was there. So it kind of strengthened what the defense was saying. And speaking of Lori's mother, Hazel, Hazel felt that this judge was super biased from the beginning. She said that she felt like from 
day one that this judge was on Michelle's side and was just looking for a reason to release her. But with that said, the police had withheld this information. And this was information that would be super useful at Michelle's trial. And it would have shown that Lawrence could have been there and it could have raised reasonable doubt. The judge ended up claiming that the misconduct was ridiculous and Lisa Michelle Lambert was released. Lisa said of the murder, I'm going to go back and forth between Lisa and Michelle because she's going back and forth between Lisa and Michelle. Lisa Michelle Lambert said of the murder, and I quote, I'm sorry that she died. And if I would have thought that anything like that would have happened on December 20th, I never would have gotten out of bed. The judge in Lisa Michelle Lambert's um, hearing claimed that the Lancaster County had, quote, made a pact with the devil and that the prosecutor's misconduct had violated Michelle's rights for due process. And he straight up barred the state from ever trying her for murder again. He was like, guess what, Pennsylvania? Fuck around and find out. <laughs> and damn, dude, that's so wild. I've never heard of that happening. And people were not having it. People thought that he was overstepping by saying that like the state could never retry her again, because technically they should legally be able to do so. And Lori's family even tried to get him impeached. Whatever you do to get rid of it. Recalled. They tried to get this judge recalled. They ended up collecting 37 thousand signatures. So a lot of people agreed with them and six states joined Pennsylvania in filing a brief to the third circuit court of appeals because they also disagreed with the judge judge's ruling that the state could never retry Michelle. It was just a very messy and controversial move on his part. And the court of appeals ended up agreeing with them saying that Michelle should have never had that hearing done in federal court. Anyway, it needed to be done at a state level. And an investigation was done in the um, misconduct that they were saying had happened in her initial trial. And it was found that there wasn't enough evidence to support that to arrest anybody for that misconduct. So, so after 10 months of freedom, Lisa Michelle Lambert was rearrested. She was put back in prison so that she could await trial in the appropriate courthouse court system, courthouse system. The prosecution this time tried to show how completely unbelievable the idea of Michelle being framed actually was because of the amount of people who would have to be involved, many of whom who did not know each other and would have no reason to lie for each other. Additionally, they claimed that the reason for a conspiracy and a cover up was ridiculous. They said that the story of the gang rape was likely untrue, that it probably didn't happen because Michelle had a boy who cries wolf syndrome. And she essentially had blamed several people from the time she was in captivity of raping her. We will get into that a little more later because there might be a little truth to at least some of it, but this is what they were saying. Michelle did end up getting a new trial date, as I said, and she was released for a short period of time during this because it was believed that she was probably going to get out again because of what was happening with the, the trial. And at this trial, there was a new witness who testified to the fact that he had known Michelle pretty well and that he had seen her in Lawrence's relationship and that Lawrence was abusive and was controlling. And he saw a difference in Michelle in the time that she was with him and that he could corroborate that she would do anything to protect Lawrence because that is how their relationship was. And he also testified that at one point he and Michelle had been at like a fair together and he had seen a cop who fit the description of one of the cops who Michelle had said had gang raped her and that this cop was giving her an intimidating glare, a quote, threatening stare. So in 1998, her new trial officially began and it was heard before the same judge who had found her guilty last time. And Michelle was like, listen, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I'm not guilty. I was covering for Lawrence. It was actually Lawrence who did everything. Lawrence was choking Lori. I was there. He was choking Lori and he told me to leave. And I did just that because I do what Lawrence says. So now she wasn't involved. And instead of meeting Lawrence outside and being told to wait outside, she was inside with him. And he told he was, he was actively choking Lori and told her to leave. That's the new story. There's a lot of stories from her. That's the thing is there's so many different stories coming from Michelle that I'm like, Girl, how do you expect anyone to believe you when you change your story every 15 minutes? Michelle's attorney told the court the same thing they had at the previous hearing, that Michelle was gang raped by a group of cops six months prior to the murder, and that the whole thing was a conspiracy against her to frame her. Michelle's attorneys also claimed, okay, <laughs> this is fucking crazy. They claimed that these cops, and I'm all for believing that cops could set up crimes 
Like, we see it. It happens. But this is so fucking stupid. Her attorneys are claiming that these cops were so dead set on framing Michelle for Lori's murder that they went and took Lori's body out of the morgue, brought her back to the crime scene, staged her body on the floor, and took new photos of the crime scene that would make... that would implicate Michelle more. And to me, that's just so fucking crazy. Like, it's such... You might want to stretch before you take that fucking leap. Because that is just absolutely bananas to me. But that is what they were saying. And the cops were like, no. Like, we didn't do that. They just, they, they obviously denied everything. They denied taking her body from the morgue to take new crime scene photos. And, of course, they denied the, the gang rape. And one of the cops that Michelle claimed had raped her actually ended up showing proof that at the time that she said she was raped, he was out of the state on his honeymoon. So, doesn't sound like it happened, but I mean, I don't know. Tabitha ended up testifying at Michelle's new trial as well. And I believe this was actually the first time that she told her side of the story out loud, if I remember correctly. 99% sure. And she told the court that she was testifying because it was the right thing to do. She told the court that she had been there and that she had even helped restrain Lori. So she did implicate herself as an accomplice, but she said that she did not kill Lori. She did not stab Lori. That was all Michelle. She also spoke to Michelle's callousness, saying that once Lori was already down on the ground, stabbed, hurt, bleeding, that she knelt down beside her and cut her throat, sawing back and forth like she was, quote, cutting a loaf of bread. That's the way she described it. And that Michelle just, just didn't care. She just didn't care about anything. She was just like, you're not gonna take my man. And that's what she did. And to illustrate that Tabitha was saying that she was involved, she said that like, when Lori tried to run out of the room, she did block the door to make it so that she couldn't leave. And she did hold her legs while Michelle was killing her. So she said that she could see right into Lori's throat after the, the slashing and that she was making a quote, whooshing sound. This is a child, dude. It's so fucked up. Tabitha also reiterated that Lawrence was not there. Lawrence was not involved in the murder. She'd have no real reason to protect Lawrence. There's nothing that she's going to gain from not implicating Lawrence. So I don't know why she would lie here, but she said like Lawrence wasn't there. This is just Michelle's way of trying to deflect blame and trying to make it seem like it wasn't her, but that Michelle was a totally on board active participant and that she had even told Tabitha prior to to the crime to like pull her hair up, not wear makeup, not wear nail polish, to not leave evidence. And during all of this testimony, Lori's parents were there. They sat in the back row of the courthouse and sobbed through the entire thing. Cause I cannot imagine hearing all of that about your kid, but I also can't imagine not going. So in the end, the judge did decide that Michelle was still guilty and she would remain in prison. And the judge even stated that even if he believed her story, she was still guilty of first degree murder as an accomplice Anyways, Michelle said of Lori's murder, and I quote, I do not believe in any way that I am responsible for the death of Lori show. The police and East area township and the prosecution's office blamed me for a murder I did not commit. Hazel, Lori's mother said of Michelle, and I quote, Michelle's the one who cut Lori's throat. Michelle deserves to have a miserable long life in prison, not special treatment. There's nothing special about her. She's just evil. Lisa Michelle Lambert appeared in court to sue the correctional institution over claims that she was raped and assaulted by state prison staff in 1996. Her attorney argued that the institution had done nothing to stop the assaults. And in the end, she did end up receiving a $35,000 settlement. And the guard that she was claiming had assaulted her ended up going to jail and he served one to three years, one and a half to three years in prison. So, when I said there might be something to the rape allegations, that's what I mean. Because I mean, why would the officer end up serving any time? And why would the state agree to pay her $35,000 if there wasn't at least some truth to that claim? In 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to hear Michelle's case. And with that, all of her appeals had been exhausted. So the legal proceedings for Michelle are kind of done. Like you have so many appeals and once you exhaust all those appeals, there's not much more you can do. And that's kind of where she's at right now. She's tried, she's tried, she's tried. She tried so hard to lose it all. 
And in the end, it doesn't even matter. Uh, uh, uh. She is in jail and it doesn't seem like she's getting out anytime soon. And the last report I saw on Hazel, Lori's mother, is that she's still living in the same apartment. Even though that must be really hard for her, she said that it just feels like she's there and that she can sense that she's there anytime she sees like a light flicker or the vacuum switch turn on and off or like, or like a flicker on the TV set. She says that she feels like her daughter is there, so she stays there. She said of this, and I quote, it makes you more comfortable to think that she's nearby. I know technically she's in heaven, but sometimes I think she's saying, quote, hey mom, I'm still here. I'm watching out for you. And I didn't find many quotes from Lori's father, John, but I did find one and I want to end this case with this quote because I feel like it's a really good representation of the ripple effect that these murders can have. It's very sad and it just shows you that these people who kill people don't just make victims of the people they murder, but they make victims out of everyone who loves this person. John said of losing his only child, and I quote, it hurts. I see people who have children, family. Hazel and I don't have any grandchildren. It's tough and it hurts. And with that quote, that my friends is the story of the murder of 16 year old Lori Show. Isn't that just such a wild ride? Like, what do you think? What was the first thought you had? Cause I went all over the place with this. I definitely think Michelle did it. I don't really question that aspect that much. And I don't really question it at all actually. Cause like Michelle seemed deeply unhinged just based on all of her prior actions. It seems very, very clear that she did this, that she had a deep seated hatred for Lori. And I also get the impression that she was just like a very deeply insecure person. I didn't mention during this telling of the story about Michelle's looks, even though when you look into this case, you see it reported a lot because Michelle was a naturally pretty person, right? She had like dark hair. She was like a good looking human being, but she like bleached her hair to shit. And she wore like these color contacts that turned her brown eyes blue. And she wore like a ton of makeup. And I'm not saying that changing yourself that much physically um, is an indication solely of being um, insecure with yourself, but that combined with this like intense insecurity of, about a 16 year old child where you were that worried that that's such a threat to you and your relationship that you kill her for it. It just, those two combined lead me down the path that makes me believe that she's a very insecure human being. I do think it's possible that Lawrence was more involved, maybe not with actually being there or helping commit the murders, but definitely with like egging his girlfriend, Michelle on. I mean, he like drove her to the mall that day where she got out and like slammed her head into a car. I could see Lawrence doing that. And I could see him having a motive to do that, especially since Lori had said that he raped her. He definitely would have a reason not to want her around. And so I can see him like sort of fanning the flames that already existed inside Michelle to get her to do what he wants. But in the end, I do think that Michelle is the one who did it. And I think that she's exactly where she belongs. But that's just my opinion. What do you think? Do you think Michelle is guilty? Do you think Lawrence is more involved? Do you think it's fair that Lawrence and Tabitha are already out of jail? Tell me everything you think down below. I need to know your opinions because this case is insane. Now with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the brutal murder of 16 year old Adrian Reynolds. And I want to start this particular story off with a quote from Adrian's mother upon learning the fate of her 16 year old daughter. She said, and I quote, I'm not even able to bury my daughter. They tell me they don't even have all of her. I believe in God and I believe she's in a better place, but I would rather have her here with me. So the night of January 20th, 2005 was a normal night, a night like any other in the home that Adrian Reynolds lived in. She had recently moved in with her adopted father, a man named Tony in Moline. So that night, Adrian was going to bed. She said goodnight to her, her father, Tony. She told him that she loved him. He told her that he loved her. She gave him a kiss and she headed off to bed like she did 
on all evenings and things were completely normal that night. The whole family went to bed and the following morning, Tony woke up for work early. And when I say early, he left that day at like four o'clock in the morning. So early. He left um, leaving Adrian alone with his wife, Joan, having no idea that that night that he had said goodnight to Adrian was going to be the last night that he ever saw her. That the words, I love you too, were going to be the last words he ever heard from his 16 year old daughter. So now let's back up a little bit and talk about Adrian Reynolds as a person and what happened in her life that led up to her living in and eventually being murdered in Moline, Illinois. So Adrian Lee Reynolds was born September 12th, 1988. So literally right around the same time as me, just a couple of months before I was born. It's so wild to think that she would be turning 34 this year if this had not happened to her. But anyways, she was born in Kilgore, Texas to a teenage mother. And I can only imagine how difficult that is because now that I am a mother, bro, this shit is hard. It's a very difficult thing to do. I cannot imagine doing it as a teenager and without my husband, like partnerless, without another adult to share the load and the responsibility with, I cannot imagine hats off to all teenage and single parents. I don't know how you do it truly. I just hats off, hats off because it sounds um, impossible to me. Anyways, Carolyn, Adrian's mother, her name was Carolyn. Well, Carolyn said that Adrian, who was lovingly given the nickname Little Bit or Angel, was shy or quiet at first, but after you got to know her, she was really bubbly, happy. She smiled often and she was a talkative girl who loved the sound of her own voice, talking or singing. She had an amazing voice from a young age. Apparently she like killed it singing Amazing Grace. And her biggest dream as a kid was to be on American Idol. During family get togethers, they would turn on the karaoke machine and they would take turns singing. And that was something they, really miss now that Adrian's gone. They really miss hearing her singing voice. Things in Adrian's life really um, took a took a big change, took a swift left turn, right turn, went in a new direction when she was about 12 years old. It was at this time that apparently she had suffered from a burst appendix, which put her behind at school and she was never fully able to recover academically. And she just sort of gave up a bit and started at this time hanging out with a more unsavory group and fell further and further away from her mother. Adrian was a wild child, rebellious, a bit of a troublemaker, always getting into fights, smoking weed, partying, and even had been in rehab by the time she was sent to live with her father. She was getting sent there to hopefully get herself back on track because she had just like really been dropping the ball and blowing it at school. And this was her parent, her, well, her parents thought process was that this was the only way she was going to get like a little bit of a culture shock and get her shit together and actually graduate. So two months after Adrian's 16th birthday, she was sent to live with her father, Tony and his wife, Joan in Illinois. And now, um, Joan, loved Adrian, loved having Adrian live there. She said that even though Adrian did turn their home a little bit upside down, their home in Illinois upside down, they loved having her there. And just for clarity, cause it gets a little confusing. Um, the like family dynamic. Okay. So Caroline, Carolyn, Carolyn, Adrian's mother, biological mother. She lived in Texas. Tony, Adrian's adopted father lived in Illinois. So basically what happened here is that Tony was married to Beverly. Beverly was Adrian's maternal grandmother. Okay. And at one point when Beverly and Tony were still together, they adopted Adrian because Caroline was a teenage mother. And I, I don't know exactly what was going on there, but they adopted her and she, Adrian lived with them for a while before finally going to live back with her biological mother in Texas later in life but come 2005, that arrangement just wasn't doing very well. And by this time, Tony and Beverly were no longer together. He's now with Joan. I hope that I explained that. It's not like super important, but I know it can get confusing when we talk about Tony as her father, but he's also her grandfather. Anyway, so 2005, 
Adrian sent to live with her father, Tony. And I think the thought process here was that it would be good for Adrian to have like a refresher, right? A change of pace, a new family dynamic. I think her mother at this point was just desperate to try to get her on track. I believe at this point she was a single mom. She was working in a convenience store. Adrian was getting out of control. It was just more than she could handle. And this was her attempt to try to do something better for her child. Adrian's mother said of her decision to send Adrian to live with her father, quote, I sent her there thinking she would be safer, end quote. But less than six months later, her daughter would be murdered in an unimaginable way. So once in Illinois, Adrian was enrolled in a school called the Black Hawk College Outreach Center, which essentially to me sounds like a continuation school. It appears to be a college as well, obviously, college outreach center. But for Adrian's purposes, it seems like she was just going because she was having trouble in conventional school and was trying to get her GED because she wanted to join the Marines. Adrian's issue just seemed to be that she just like didn't like school or homework, relatable, and she just liked having a social life and she liked boys. Like that was her thing. She was a teenager. It's pretty normal. I mean, I can relate to that because that was the life that I also lived. And I know I actually mentioned this before, though I cannot remember what video I mentioned it in, but this is actually the kind of school that I graduated from as well. When I tell Adrienne's story, like when I was looking into it, she felt so familiar to me. I mean, we're like the same age, we were the same age. So we were doing the same things at the same time, the same sort of social situations, going to the same types of schools. And basically what this type of school is, is like a school that kids that kind of get into either disciplinary or academic trouble get sent to so that they can hopefully get their GED or their diplomas. For me, I was able to get my diploma, but I know that some people went just to get GEDs. <laughs> and not that it really matters, but I looked into this school because I was like, why not? Let's look into this. And the reviews are split. Um, some people are saying it's like the best thing that ever happened to them. And some people are saying like, this school seriously sucks. But I guess that could be, um, that would probably be the case if you look at the reviews for any school, depending on who the reviewer is. But I just thought, that I would mention it because I looked into it. And now that's information that I have in my head um, about a random school in Illinois that I am gonna have to live with forever. So now you have to live with forever. <laughs> Anyways, Adrian, trying to get her shit together, trying to get her GED, going to the Black Hawk College Outreach Center. She's also got a job. She's working at a place called Checkers. I have never heard of Checkers prior to looking into this case. I don't think we have them where I live, but if you have them where I live, let me know if I'm right. I believe it's sort of like a Sonic, but without the skates. Correct me if I'm wrong. Anyways, now that you have all the background, it was while Adrian was attending the Black Hawk College Outreach Center. That's gonna get very annoying to say each time. I don't know how many more times I'm gonna have to say it, but take a shot every time I do say it. Don't do that, it's gonna be bad for you. Anyway, it was while attending that school that Adrian met two teenagers that would eventually lead to her losing her life. These are gonna be the two kids that murder her. And this was a girl named Sarah and a person named Harley. Now, for clarity, Harley, at the time that this happened, so Harley is a transgender woman. Um, at the time that this took place, she had not yet transitioned. I don't know what her mental space was, but she hadn't transitioned. Um, she was still living her life as a biological male. Um, she was going by a different name, but for the purposes of this video, since in the last few years, she has started going by Harley. Harley Quinn actually is the name chosen. Uh, I'm going to refer to this person as Harley, but I just wanted to clarify and say that in case you have heard of this case, so it doesn't get kind of confusing. And just also for a disclaimer, if there's any terminology, if I say anything wrong, it's not from a place of hate, it's from a place of lack of information. Obviously, I feel like that's clear, but I mean, some people are set out in general just to misunderstand you. That's just like life. So for clarity, from a place of a lack of information, not a place of hate. I got nothing but love for everyone, except for people that fucking suck like Sarah and Harley in this case. So <laughs> now Harley and Sarah were both juggalos. Now, <laughs> I don't know if this is still a thing to be honest, but boy, it certainly was a thing when I was a teenager, which is the same time that Adrian, Sarah, Harley were all teenagers. And basically what a juggalo is, is a fan of the musical group ICP. If you like ICP, 
Uh, don't feel judged by me. It's not for me. I knew Juggalos. I knew Juggalos when I was in high school and in junior high. Um, it's a vibe. It's not the vibe for me, but do you. And Harley and Sarah, they did that. <laughs> okay. And I don't even feel like this needs to be said, but I'm going to say it anyway, because there's always somebody who's going to be like, oh, I can't believe she's implying that because they are Juggalos, they are murderers and this led to murder. That's not what I'm saying. But this case is often referred to as like the juggalo murder. And when you look into it, like it's always mentioned that they were juggalo. So I'm just mentioning it. Obviously, um, that did lead to the murder. And obviously like the music you listen to, in my opinion, doesn't lead to, um, you killing people. Because if that was the case, if the music you listen to is a reflection of how violent you're going to be, um, like lock a, lock a bitch up because the stuff I listen to, uh, if you were to put me on paper, it's not going to look good. You know what I mean? But obviously, there are other things that contribute, and this is just one of the bullet points of who they were, especially at this time. They were dressing in those baggy pants, they were listening to that music, and that's just a fact of this case. Okay, now that we've introduced everybody, let's get into a little bit of background on these two people, and let's start with Harley, Ms. Quinn. Harley was known as being a quiet person, a person who really didn't stand out much except for their style. They were a bit of a metalhead, a 2005, 2005's metalhead, I guess, and they just liked to listen to music, smoke weed, and hang out with their ex-girlfriend turned best friend. This was Sarah. Sarah, who was living with her mother Kathy and stepdad Darren at the time, was similar to Harley in their interests, but different in that Sarah was a natural leader and Harley a follower. Sarah had a strong presence and demanded attention. Her presence demanded your attention. She was normally seen as pretty laid back, but Sarah was very temperamental and could easily have her temper flared. She was a very confident and aggressive and just a very like boss bitch. That was like the, the general vibe from people who knew her. An ex-boyfriend of Sarah said of her, and I quote, I've seen her get crazy, but I'd never seen her beat anybody up or say she'd kill somebody. She'd say, quote, I want to kick their ass, end quote, but nothing serious. Which, okay, sure. That um, sounds reasonable. Nothing serious. No real violence, except for at trial, uh, it was read in her journal that Sarah had written some things that would imply that she was a little more violent and a little more dangerous. Things like, quote, what is it with people today? It seems as if everyone is driving me crazy and all I want to do is slaughter them like the fucking sheep they are. So, and listen, I know that teenagers sometimes just say some shit. If you were to read my high school journals, you'd be like, maybe this bitch is crazy. But we don't take all of that too seriously because teenagers are angsty. I don't know about all teenagers, but I was angsty. A lot of the people I knew were angsty. But here's the thing. When we look at this case and how it plays out, is being a juggalo alone a contributing factor? No. Is the things that she wrote in her journal alone something to be concerned about? Maybe, maybe not. But seeing as how this case turns out, maybe there was something going on there. Maybe the writing is a bit more sinister when you add it with what happened. And maybe she was a violent person. Maybe. Adrian's family did meet Sarah once and she didn't make like the best first impression. They weren't super into her. Her father said that like they equated her like black clothing and the piercings in her face, the makeup, the way that she looked as her being a quote thug or freak. And she just sort of had this like goth thing going on, which was like the style, the juggalo style with like, you know, the big pants and the black and like the two pieces of bangs, you know, if you know, you know, and if you don't, you don't, and I don't know how to explain it. You just have to know. And, um, they said that Sarah was super into this whole goth thing, but Adrian really wasn't until she met Sarah. Tony and Joan were of the position that Adrian just wanted to have friends. She wanted to be friends, not even just with Sarah specifically, but Sarah at this Black Hawk college outreach center was a very popular girl. She had a lot of friends. Um, so they believed that Adrian just wanted 
to have friends and Sarah was there and Sarah was friendly and Sarah was popular and Adrian just wanted to be friends with everybody, which is why she partially why she was friends with Sarah, even though they were so different and Sarah was like a goth. And it's funny, I actually wouldn't consider like ICP fans goths, I guess like sort of, I feel like it's one of those distinctions that unless you're in that like subculture, you don't see the difference. It's like saying that like goths, punks, emos are all like the same because unless you're in that subculture, it's really hard to tell the difference, but I guess they could sort of be goth. I don't know, but that is neither here nor there. But anyways, Adrian wanted to be everyone's friends, right? And she like, for all intents and purposes was when she went to the school, everybody at the new school really seemed to like her. She was very likable. Um, she got along with everyone. She had this like cute little Southern accent and the kids at the school called her Texas for her little Southern accent. But of all the people that she had gotten close with since going to the school, and she wasn't even at this school very long. That's something that I don't know if I've mentioned yet, but at the time that she was killed, she had only, she'd been there half a year. You know what I mean? But of all the people that she had befriended in her time at the school, her closest was Sarah. And in this school, as I mentioned, Sarah was a popular girl, the leader of her pack. The main person in her pack though, her number one person was Harley. The two had met as teenagers. Well, like younger teenagers, because at the time of the story, they're still teenagers. Doesn't sound like it because of the brutality of what they do, but they, they were still teenagers at the time. But the two, once they met as younger teenagers, bonded quickly and became inseparable. Harley was in love with Sarah. And though they had only dated a few weeks, Harley had vowed to love her forever, saying, and I quote, I love you. I have since I first laid eyes on you. You were all that I think about. You were the only one I felt I could speak my emotions to. And I want you to know that I'll always be that for you. Big feelings, right? Teenage love. Teenage love is nothing but big feelings. <laughs> Teresa Gregory, which is Harley's mother, said of this relationship between her child and Sarah, and I quote, and actually before I say the quote, just keep in mind that this quote um, is gonna seem a bit dated because this quote is from before Harley transitioned. Harley, I believe, transitioned in, in 2022, like started living their life um, as a woman. So this quote is going to seem dated because at the time that she said it, Harley was still living as a biological man. So quote, Corey really wanted to be boyfriend and girlfriend really bad. And I think Corey in the back of his mind thought if he just hung in there long enough as her best friend, she would someday see him as a boyfriend because he was loyal to her and hung in. So the issue here among um, many issues is that Sarah, wanted everyone. She was a little bit of a selfish lady. Okay. So she didn't want to be in a relationship with Harley, right? Harley was in love with her. Didn't want to be in a relationship with her. They had dated. She had ended it, but she wanted Harley to herself at this time that all of this happened. She also had a boyfriend, right? So she has a boyfriend. She has Harley. And now that Harley has introduced Sarah to their new friend, Adrian, this new girl in school, Sarah looks over at Adrian is like, I want her too. So Sarah was bisexual and Adrian was sort of still figuring that out. She's 16 years old. She's figuring out where, how she feels. She definitely was boy crazy. She really liked guys. There was no question about that, but she was curious about where she might fall on the sexuality spectrum as a whole. In comes Sarah. So Sarah seemed to be a bit more serious about this budding relationship than Adrian was. Adrian definitely seemed to be into Sarah. Like she always wanted to talk to her. She always wanted to hang out with her. But the way that I interpreted this in everything that I read is that Adrian was more interested in being in Sarah's circle, being friends with Sarah and like the idea of a relationship with her than the actual act of being in one. And so Sarah was definitely more invested in it than Adrian was, at least in the romantic aspect of their relationship. So Adrian would still flirt with other guys, kiss other guys, hang out with other guys. And Sarah would see this. She would get very, very jealous. She was jealous. She was possessive. I think she probably felt like Adrian was like leading her on 
a little bit. And if that wasn't already bad for somebody like Sarah who had like a bit of an anger problem and was a bit possessive over her people, people that she believed were her people, things went from bad to worse when Adrian and guess who started talking? Harley. So Adrian and Harley started having a bit of a flirtation. And when Sarah found out, that was fucking it. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. She was not okay with this at all. I guess the two had already been having problems, you know, with Sarah seeing Adrian flirting with these guys. So they they were already having some drama according to people who went to school with them. But after this, that was it. Sarah started calling Adrian a slut and a whore and completely exiled her from her group of friends. Adrian at this point got like really upset and would constantly reach out to Sarah to write her notes, try to call her. And whenever Sarah would answer the phone, she would just yell at her or hang up on her. At school, Adrian would try to talk to Sarah, try to reason with her, try to, to mend the friendship, but Sarah would just yell at her, make her cry and tell her to kill herself. Adrian even started, you know, writing her the little notes, passing her notes between class. You remember, you remember being a teenager. And she would say things to Sarah in these notes like, quote, I wanted a chance for us to start over again and to at least be friends. And in another note she wrote, why do you hate me so much? And why do you want me to die? Which in hindsight, hearing that is incredibly eerie to me. So on Friday, January 21st, 2005, Adrian was scheduled to work a shift at her job at Checkers. And when Adrian didn't arrive home that evening to change into her uniform for, for her shift for that day, her father, Tony knew that something was wrong. Cause though Adrian did a lot of things like, you know, she got herself into some trouble. She was a bit of a rebellious person. She was not one to miss work. Like she was a good employee. She like showed up, you know what I'm saying? So when she didn't show up, um, to change into her uniform, her family knew something was wrong because they had already confirmed that she had a shift that day. Like that morning, remember Tony left at 4am. Joan stayed home probably cause she was just already going to be home, but she would get Adrian up and ready and off for school. And she had confirmed with Adrian that morning that she did in fact have a shift that evening. It just was not like Adrian to just bail because that was where she drew her line. She actually, um, enjoyed working. So she would always go and, you know, she was trying to get her life together on top of this. So when she didn't show home, her father decided to actually get in his truck and drive over to checkers to see if she was there. He just needed to see for himself that she had actually arrived instead of just like calling over. So he drove over and when he got there, he found that no, Adrian had never showed up for her shift that day. And initially Tony actually got sort of pissed at Adrian because even though he knew it wasn't like her to bail, of course, he's not going to automatically think the worst and think something horrible had happened. So he thought that maybe she had just been out fucking around with some of her friends and had just not gone to work. Cause really what would the alternative be in his brain that like she had gotten hurt? Well, nobody had called him. She was underage. If she had ended up in a hospital, I imagine somebody would have called that she had run away, but like that, what didn't really seem likely considering, um, she had never run away before and she had willingly moved to her father's house. You know what I mean? The only, she was going to run away, I guess, maybe to run back home to her mom, but like she wasn't happy there in the first place. So in his brain, she was just maybe fucking around and had not gone to work that day. But as the hours passed and Adrian still wasn't heard from, Tony started to get a little more worried and he started calling all of her friends to see if anybody had heard from her, if anybody had talked to her. But each call that he made, he got the same answer. No, no one had seen her. No one had talked to her. No one had heard from her at all since lunch at school that day. So panicked at this point, Tony calls, not calls, he reports his 16 year old daughter as missing. Tony said of this realization that Adrian had missed work that day. And I quote, she wasn't an angel or anything, but she always, she had never not come home from school. Never. Initially, the first theory of what had happened here was of course that Adrian had voluntarily run away. But this theory was quickly squashed because there was no evidence to support this though. She was having, you know, these issues at school, nothing had really happened that would lead to her running away. She also didn't take any of her stuff with her. It was even payday, right? It's Friday, it's payday. And she didn't even stop to pick up her paycheck. So it didn't seem likely that she had just ran off. 
Adrian's family searched for her extensively on their own. They went around and posted missing persons flyers everywhere. And her dad would just like drive around looking for her. It's so sad. He said that he drove, you know, he, he drove a truck, which I already said. And he said he would drive around and there wasn't a single car that he passed that he didn't look in trying to, to find his daughter. Adrian's family was so frantic to find her dude that they even consulted a psychic to try to get information on where she might be. And of course, the psychic told them that Adrian was alive and that she was being held in a basement somewhere, which wasn't true and is very upsetting that they were told that. But while this is happening, while they're searching frantically for Adrian, while they're consulting psychics and putting up flyers and talking to the police and going out and searching themselves, Sarah and Harley are convincing their parents to get them attorneys to talk to police. So as the days pass with no sign of Adrian and seemingly no real progress on her case, the small police force in Moline accepted help from the state police. And it was shortly after this that they received their first helpful tip. This was a tip that someone had actually seen Adrian in a Taco Bell parking lot around midday, the day she was last seen. So the day she had gone missing. It was discovered that Adrian had been seen in this parking lot with two of her friends, a 16 year old Sarah and a 17 year old Harley. And when her parents heard this, they were a bit worried because Adrian had recently confided in her, her stepmother, Joan, that she, Adrian liked Harley and that Sarah, was super, super pissed about it. And that Adrian was worried about how Sarah may react to her because Sarah was such a controlling and possessive person. Obviously after getting this tip, police bring in Sarah and Harley and question them and they get pretty similar stories. Not exactly the same, but pretty similar stories. And the general consensus is that Sarah and Harley picked up Adrian and they all got lunch before, um, Sarah, and Harley dropped Adrian off at a McDonald's near her home. And they said that they dropped her off there instead of taking her home per Adrian's suggestion, because her father would not want to see her in the car with a boy. Again, this is pre transition for Harley. Um, so they said that they dropped her off there. Uh, so she wouldn't get into trouble. Sure. Sounds reasonable. Police went on to ask Sarah if her and Adrian were friends and Sarah straight up was like, <laughs> no, I don't even like her. So they were like, that's kind of odd considering you gave her a ride. And she's like, well, yeah, I did give her a ride and we went and we got lunch and we actually did get in a fight. She admitted that they got in a fight, that they called each other some names, that they yelled, that they even hit each other a couple of times, but that after that, the two had resolved their issues. They had buried the hatchet. Everything was cool. And they dropped Adrian off. No big deal. You don't need to look over here. It's just crazy. It seems like Sarah was the type of person that lied well in that she told just as much truth as she could without telling the full truth, because that's like the better way to lie. That's like the successful way to lie. You know, it's like, tell as much truth as possible. Um, she even admitted that like during this time, Adrian was like crying and was scared that Sarah was going to like beat her ass. And that Sarah told her like, you know what? You're not even worth it. It's not worth getting in trouble to hurt you. She was just like super ballsy, dude. She said all of this very a matter, very a matter of fact, very matter of fact. And she even ended the conversation with police with asking them if they heard anything about Adrian to please give her a call and let her know. Now, Harley, Harley initially had a little bit of a different story. Harley denied everything. Harley denied that the girls even had a disagreement. There was nothing that happened there. They were all super good friends. They went, they had their food, they dropped her off. Nothing happened, nothing to see here. Everything was honky dory, honky dory, oh, okay, okay? That's what Harley was saying. But it was Harley who eventually cracked. Apparently, this situation, living with what had happened, became more than Harley could bear. I hope that they were seeing Adrian in their dreams, truly. I hope that they were being haunted, considering what happened here. But it was Harley who ended up cracking and going to police and saying that not only were they and Sarah responsible for Adrian's disappearance, Adrian wasn't just missing. She was dead. The day before making this admission to police, Harley had a little bit of a mental breakdown to their parents. Harley's father said the night before Harley ended up going and admitting what had happened to police, they had been at home and Harley was crying. 
And so uh, the father, Bert, his name was Bert, started asking Harley questions about Adrian. And as the questions were asked, Harley got more and more hysterical. And it was at this point that Bert knew that something was really wrong. Bert asked Harley things like, did something happen to her in that car? Did she get hurt in the car? Did she get hurt bad? Is she dead? And each time the question was asked, Harley would just start crying harder and shake their head like, yes. It was at this point that Bert called Teresa Harley's mother and told her she needed to get over right away because some shit was going down. And he believed that Teresa had the right to know firsthand in person, like what was going on um, before everything just came out because it was going to come out. And dude, let's stop real quick right there. Because can you even imagine being the parents of this person, dude? Like, how do you deal with that? How do you come to terms with this information? Cause like, this is the same baby that you raised, right? This is the little baby that you held in your arms and you love so unconditionally and you sacrificed for, and you stayed up all night for just holding them and loving them and looking into their little face because you wanted to, and you look at them and you picture all of the wonderful things they are going to become all the, 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 the things they're going to be interested in, the type of person they're going to be hoping that they're going to just be this good person. And just thinking about all the endless possibilities of this little person that you are so in love with has. And then you find out that this is what they've done, that all of that has led to this moment. I do not see how you reconcile those feelings and like how you would feel and wondering what you did wrong even though you may not have done anything wrong. It's just, it's so hard to even think about like this little baby that you love so much turning into that. Like, man, I don't know how anybody deals with that. I just can't imagine how hard something like that must be. And that decision to turn your child in, it just seems so like it's what you have to do, but it seems like it would be so hard. And Bert was actually asked like if it was difficult for him to, to turn in his child to police. And he said of this, and I quote, Oh, I don't know if it was difficult. It was the right thing needed to be done. A family needed to know where their daughter was. Things needed to be straightened out. I mean, you can't hide something like this. It's the right thing to do. He needs to face up to what he did, what his part was. And Harley's mother, Teresa said that they believed that admitting what had happened had brought Harley some peace that prior to this, they had been a broken, a broken child, that the stress and the anxiety of what they had done, the guilt, and also all the steps that they had to take after to try to cover up the tracks had just become too much. So getting all of that off their chest was a relief to Harley, which cool. I'm glad you have some peace now, Harley, but where's like Adrian's peace? Where's Adrian's family's peace? I mean, it's cool that there was a confession, obviously, but like, fuck your peace, I guess is what I'm saying. I just don't have like a lot of compassion and tolerance for murderers, people who kill other people, people who kill children, 16, that is a child. It's hard for me to give a shit that that just might be me. Um, might be my opinion, but that's kind of where I fall. I don't know. Four days after she was reported missing, Harley led police to Adrian's dismembered arms and head earrings still in her ears inside a garbage bag inside a dirt covered manhole. The next day, Harley took police to a farm, Sarah's family's farm where police were then led to Adrian's charred torso and legs in the woods on the farm. So apparently what led to this crime was a very jealous and unstable girl. So (laughs) Sarah, (laughs) Sarah at this time has a boyfriend, right? She's dating somebody else. She also had already dated Harley, decided she didn't want to date Harley anymore. Wasn't interested in maintaining that relationship. The two were just friends. Okay. But Sarah was selfish. She wanted everybody to herself. So even though her and Harley were not together, didn't want to be with Harley, had ended the relationship with Harley, when Harley and Adrian started talking, having a bit of a flirtation, maybe a bit of a crush on each other, 
this totally unacceptable sarah could not handle adrian stealing her person Ugh. even though you sarah did not want harley like ma'am hello hello and it wasn't even like what was happening with harley and adrian was serious harley told police that adrian and and harley had just kissed a couple of times like it wasn't even anything they were maybe gonna go on a date it was pretty casual but sarah not a casual person i guess i don't know <laughs> because when harley called sarah to let sarah know what had happened what was going on between the two of them sarah was pissed and hung the phone up on them it was like i'm not even gonna engage in this conversation i guess sarah was forgiving at least of of harley because apparently 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 i've never been on television before no apparently um harley and sarah made up pretty quickly by the next day they were cool cool as cucumbers everything was tight and all of her anger was directed at adrian and sarah even wrote about adrian in her journal the day adrian went missing and i quote stupid bitch needs to back up off my kool-aid she's gonna give him a note yeah i'll fucking kill her back up off my kool-aid if that's not the most 2005 statement that i've ever heard then i don't know what is so in her rage sarah invited adrian to join her harley and sarah's then boyfriend sean on january 21st 2005 to join them for lunch at taco bell i'm now going to get into the specifics of what happened just for a heads up since it's pretty fucked up there you go so the group drives over to taco bell and at some point during the drive over an altercation begins and once they get into the parking lot of the taco bell it's like a full-blown fight with the girls yelling at each other and starting to get physical during this time sarah grabs adrian by the back of the hair starts screaming at her and then pulls her in close and starts whispering in her ear which is truly one of the most unsettling parts of this to me i don't know what it is about that fact that's so creepy to me but it gives me goosebumps it was at this point that sarah's boyfriend sean was like yo you need to stop like what the fuck's going on with this shit bitch and it was at this point that sarah was like well if you don't like it get the fuck out of my car kick bricks get to step in walk and sean was like okay cool that's exactly what i'm gonna do and he got out of the car and he left walking back towards school seemingly unaware of what was gonna happen next the girls then got physical and started to hit each other according to the story adrian hit sarah in the face giving her a bloody nose and while all of this is happening harley who the two are fighting over is just sitting in the back seat smoking some cigarettes letting girls hash out their business not doing anything about it just letting them do their thing eventually though the fight ended up moving into the back seat and this is where things got more intense and now what happened here depends on whose story you believe harley says that sarah choked adrian to death sarah says harley choked adrian to death okay the prosecution's theory is that harley held adrian's arms while sarah choked adrian to death after beating her in the head with a wooden handle that she kept in her car for protection either way adrian was strangled to death in that car that day and harley says that they didn't think that they had killed her that initially they thought that she had just passed out so they just sat there smoking cigarettes but eventually when adrian didn't wake up they realized they had gone too far now keep in mind this all happened in broad daylight during a lunch rush at a taco bell how brazen and i guess it was like a cold day so the windows had fogged up so people couldn't like see inside but that's still so crazy i mean i guess like one person did come forward later as a witness saying that they saw the car and thought something was happening in the car but they couldn't see inside to see exactly what harley said the way they ended up knowing that adrian was dead is that her face and her lips had turned blue and even though they said that they weren't the ones who actually killed adrian the reason that they didn't go to 
police or do anything is because they were so in love with Sarah. And the idea of Sarah being in jail for the rest of their life was too much for Harley to bear. So instead of getting help, instead of calling police, Harley helped Sarah move Adrian's body to the trunk. So from there, Sarah and Harley drove to Sarah's family's farm, a farm that Sarah's family owns, to proceed with disposing of Adrian's body. First, they attempted to bury her, but they found that because it was Illinois and it was January, the ground was too frozen, just like in the Skylar and Ace case. That's what happened to them as well. If you haven't seen that, I covered that case on my channel as well. You can find it. Um, from there, they decided to go on to plan B. And plan B was to burn Adrian's body. So Harley took gasoline, covered Adrian with gasoline, and then lit a lighter and threw it on her. Harley and Sarah then stood there, cuddled up, watching Adrian's body burn for hours. Harley told police they did this because they believed this was the right thing to do to cremate her since they couldn't give her a proper burial, to which the police were like, cool story, bro, but I'm pretty sure you were just trying to conceal what you did and you said yourself you were trying to turn the body into ashes. I think that was more to hide the fact that you committed a murder than you doing the right thing, but sure. So when plan B failed, they moved on to plan C. And this is when Sarah asked Harley to cut up Adrian's body to make it easier to dispose of. And this is when Harley was like, no, I'm not gonna do that. That was the line for Harley. Murder, sure. Burial, no problem. Setting Adrian on fire, of course. But dismemberment, not dog. That, I would do anything for love but I won't do that. RIP me love. But anyway, this is when they reached out to another kid that they knew. This was a 16 year old kid named Nathan. Now they called Nathan, they contacted Nathan. They let Nathan know of the predicament, the problem that they were facing. And I'd love to know what that conversation was like. Cause I can't imagine just calling up one of my friends and being like, yeah, I killed somebody. I need you to cut up the body. Like what the fuck? But apparently Nathan was a weird kid who was into all things blood and gore and horror and enjoyed killing animals and stuff. So they thought he would be the perfect person for this particular task. So they contact him, they make a plan. And the next day, Harley and Sarah go pick up Nathan and the three of them drive out to Sarah's family's farm. Nathan bringing his grandfather's um, handsaw to dismember the body with. So they get to the farm and Nathan takes Adrian's body apart. And as he does so, Harley stands there with a trash bag ready to collect the head and the hands, which Sarah had decided should be disposed of in a separate location because these were identifying body parts with fingerprints and teeth so that um, police would be able to figure out who this person was. They put those parts in a manhole, covered it in dirt, and they left the remaining parts of Adrian's body in a ravine on the farm. The group then headed to McDonald's because they had worked themselves up, worked up a hunger. How? Well, during the whole dismemberment process, they smoked a bunch of weed, talked about music and got the munchies. So naturally they then had to go to McDonald's and Harley, in case you were curious, got a double cheeseburger. What words am I saying right now? And this is something that somebody actually did. I'm saying it. And I'm like, what the fuck? Somebody did this to another human being, to somebody's child, to a defenseless girl. What the fuck? Oh, and I just want to mention something because I can't get this out of my head. I can't get the visual of this out of my head. So I feel like I have to tell you about it and what that is is once the three got to the place that they were going to dispose of Adrian's arms, her hands, her head, Nathan gets out of the car, right? He tucks the shovel under his trench coat because of course he's wearing a trench coat. In the other hand, he's carrying the trash bag that contains Adrian's head and hands, okay? He then takes off running into the woods and I just pictured in my head 
as him running off like the handler brother dude and i don't know if that's just because of the mcdonald's thing it probably is but that's the visual i have and i just need you to have that because it seems like the way they described it is that he was doing it like comically like a like like a joke and i just this kid did not in my opinion get enough time for his involvement and his temperament um and his like there was no convincing needed to convince this kid to cut up a dead body and then to run off into the woods like it's a joke. And I just, I can't get that out of my head and I need you to have it too. So when you hear the sentence he got, you can maybe be enraged as well because I was like, I'm sorry, fucking what? Okay, anyways. So Harley's the one telling police this, right? And police tell Harley like, yo, you seem super unemotional when talking about something so absolutely horrific. And Harley said of this, and I quote, I am really emotional, but I like to keep my emotions to myself, you know? Harley then went on to say that the three of them had done something terrible, something worse than anything you would ever see in any horror movie. Harley's defense attorney then said that Harley, quote, feels bad that he didn't exercise better judgment and that he had no idea that this was going to culminate in murder. So when Adrian's father learned of what had happened to Adrian after she was killed, of how her body was disrespected, he said, and I quote, I never cried so much in my life. I mean, the murder was bad enough, but what they did after is the hard part. That takes a sick person to take a saw and cut somebody up. I couldn't do it to a dog, much less a human. And I don't know anybody that could, especially at 16 years old. He said that he runs three miles a day every day and that with every step he takes, he thinks about what they did to Adrian. With Harley's confession, all three were arrested in connection with Adrian's murder and dismemberment. Sarah and Harley were both charged with two counts of first degree murder and concealment. And initially, uh, the two both pled not guilty. Nathan, the 16 year old that helped dismember Adrian, was charged with concealment and ended up taking a plea deal in which he agreed to testify against both Sarah and Harley. And for a fun fact, well, I mean, it's not really a fun fact, it's just like some fucked up information. Apparently it wasn't just Harley's confession that got Nathan um, arrested. Like Harley's not the only person who turned him into police. Apparently his own grandma contacted police and turned him in after she found a blood stained saw, the handsaw that uh, belonged to Nathan's grandfather, she found that in her basement. To live so long, to live long enough to be a grandparent of a 16 year old and then have to deal with that bullshit, like they are too old for this shit. You know what I mean? Like fuck. So during Sarah's murder trial, which happened first, and by the way, oh my God, apparently during Sarah's murder trial, this little bitch had the audacity to like have a smirk on her face during the proceedings, which makes me so mad. And, but that's what Adrian's family said happened. Um, but during her trial, which happened first, there was a bunch of testimony heard, right? Teenagers from the school friends of Adrian's friends of Sarah's testified. So though some of them were like afraid to testify, but they testified that Sarah had been so aggressive to Adrian prior to the murder and that they knew that Sarah had made threats against her and had just been, you know, they, they talked about her behavior prior to the murder that would um, illustrate that she, that this may have been premeditated. And they also testified to the fact that Harley was obsessed with Sarah and would do anything that Sarah told them to. Other witnesses gave testimony that would indicate motive, like why this happened. And the first thing was that Adrian and Harley had had their little flirtation, their little fling, um, that the two of them had gone on a date and that that just was not chill to Sarah. Um, another motive that was given is that, you know, Adrian had been intimate with men during the time that Sarah wanted to pursue her. I guess there was like these house parties that they used to go to that Sarah and Adrian would go to together. And during this time at these parties, Adrian had been intimate with at least two dudes and that Sarah found out about it and was not okay with it. This pissed her off and made her a lot more angry than people thought she should have been. And one of the guys, um, 
that apparently Adrian had been intimate with said that Sarah wanted to get with Adrian, but didn't want to get with a slut. Her words, his words, never my words, because that's fucked up. One girl testified, like a coworker of Sarah's, like Sarah worked at a movie theater and this girl worked with Sarah and they had been working together after Adrian went missing. And Sarah told this girl, according to this girl, that she had gotten a, in a fight with a girl in her car that Friday and that during the fight, the girl had coughed up blood and that when they were done fighting, Harley had helped Sarah, quote, finish the job. Another girl testified that prior to Adrian being killed, Sarah had asked her if she could kill somebody by beating them in the head, which like, duh, you dumbass. Um, and then she said that Sarah said, she said, Sarah said that she planned to take a girl out to her family's farm and to beat her to death with a stick. She said that Sarah seemed very emotionless while giving this information. Sarah had mentioned to a few people that she was going to kill Adrian. She said, I don't care. She told people she wasn't afraid to kill her and she would do it and she's not scared. That's a quote from one of those girls. Nathan, the kid who helped dismember Adrian, testified against them and said that when Harley and Sarah called Nathan to have help with the dismemberment, dismemberment of the body. They told him that Sarah had fought with this girl and had beat her over and over in the head with a stick. And that then Harley held the girl down while Sarah strangled the girl. And that when the girl, this girl, Adrian, this is how they said it. When Adrian was strangled, blood came out of her mouth. And last, uh, Sarah's boyfriend at the time, Sean testified against her. And he testified that he had been in the car when the group drove to Taco Bell. And that once they had gotten there, Sarah had asked Adrian for a hug. And when Adrian went in for the hug, that's when Sarah grabbed her by the hair and started screaming in her face and fighting with her. And that's when Sean says that he told Sarah to stop and that Sarah said that if he didn't like it, he could get out, like walk his ass back to school. So he did just that, that he quote, didn't want any part of any of that. Well, not quote, that was very loose, a loose quote. He didn't want any part of any of that. He didn't think it was going to result in a murder, obviously, but he didn't want to sit there and watch two girls fight. So he got out, but he said prior to getting out of the car that Sarah, who was holding Adrian by the hair, like turned her towards Sean and Harley and told Adrian that she needed to stay the hell away from Sarah's people. So things are not looking great for Sarah, right? Like that's a pretty damning testimony against her, but that didn't stop her from trying to get out of it. She tried to, of course, blame the whole thing on Harley. It was all Harley. She says that the group went and picked up Adrian and that her and Adrian made up that they were cool, that everything was fine, that they were even talking about boys and talking about sex and everything was chill. And then Harley out of nowhere flew into a rage and attacked Adrian and ripped Adrian into the back seat and started trying to start beating her and choking her. And that Sarah, the hero that she was even tried to intervene, tried to help Adrian. And as a result, Harley hit Sarah in the face, giving her the bloody nose, breaking her nose. And she said that she also didn't take part in burning the body, that she was just there because she was scared. Okay. Because Harley had threatened to kill her, her family, even her cat. If she told anyone what had happened. She then turned and looked at the jury in dramatic fashion and said, quote, I was scared of him. I had just seen him kill somebody. Sarah's story though, wasn't super credible because first off, she's saying that like Harley had just murdered Adrian. She was terrified but she chose to spend the night with Harley after the fact. So obviously she wasn't that scared. And in addition to that, she had written in her journal the day that she killed Adrian, that she was going to kill Adrian. And the day that she killed Adrian, she had also told a bunch of people that she was going to kill Adrian. So, I mean, it was a good try, but it was bullshit in my opinion. And in the opinion of um, the jury as well. Well, well, we're going to get there. After two weeks of trial and 15 hours of deliberation, the jury, which consisted of four men and eight women, was unable to reach a verdict on any of the charges for Sarah, not the murder, not the concealment. The hung jury resulted in a mistrial. One juror was a holdout. One juror 
wanted to acquit Sarah while 11 wanted to find her guilty. 11 of them were all for convicting her, throwing her, throwing her in jail, getting rid of the key, whatever that saying is. While one of them was like, mm, I don't know, maybe she didn't do it. So this resulted in a mistrial. So she was going to have to have um, her case tried again. And the new trial happened um, in 2006. So at the end of her second trial, despite the fact that her attorney asked for a sentence of only 20 years, she was um, sentenced to 53 years in prison, 48 for the murder and five for the concealment to be served consecutively. And when the, the verdict, the sentencing was, was what the fuck am I trying to say? That's the question. When Sarah heard her fate, she had no reaction. Sarah's attorney said of her sentence, and I quote, Clearly the sentence is based on seeing her as a lifelong murderer who will do it again. I don't see it that way. The prosecution said of the murder, and I quote, to kill somebody because you don't like them, to kill somebody because you had an argument with them. It's senseless, absolutely senseless. Sarah ended up reading a letter she wrote to the courtroom and without admitting responsibility for Adrian's death, she says that she wishes she could have done more to prevent it. But she also showed just how heartless and unfeeling she was when she also said, and I quote, I felt no feeling as she died. There's no excuse why I couldn't turn off my not feeling to feel. I don't even, that's not even good English, is it? Maybe it is. Maybe I'm the one who doesn't know how to speak English, but to me that doesn't sound right. She also said that she couldn't stop thinking of a song lyric that said, quote, I would change the past if I had one wish. And I believe that's from the musician, musician, musical group, Crazy Town. From what I Googled, they're like a rock rap group. Not really my vibe, not super interested in listening to that. That doesn't sound like something I'd be into. If that's your thing, that's cool. Let me know. I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know even know what I'm saying. Anyways, shortly after Sarah's trial, Sarah's sentencing, all that jazz, Harley decided to change their plea. So initially Harley pled not guilty, but decided to change the plea to guilty um, and ended up in for that, for that. They were given 45 years, 40 years for the murder and five years for the concealment. Adrian's mother said of her daughter's murderers, and I quote, these kids have no heart. All Adrian wanted was for everybody to like her. So for the more recent update, so you remember, okay, backtrack. Harley tried to get a lighter sentence. Okay. So you remember, we've talked about this in other cases, how there was a new law written where it was deemed that minors who were given mandatory life sentences, um, it was considered to be unconstitutional and that the sentencing was going to be applied retroactively. Well, Harley tried to use this to their benefit to get a lighter sentence and a new sentencing hearing was actually set for Harley in March of 2022. So this just happened. Harley told the court that they thought their sentence was excessive and that if they served the whole thing by the time they got out of jail, they'd be useless for society and would not be able to find work. And Harley's defense attorney said at the time, and I quote, juniors tend to compound their bad decisions with further bad decisions because they don't know how to process what they're doing, don't know how to seek help. He also argued that Harley's sentence should be cut to 20 years because Harley did not have a developed brain at the time that the crime was committed. Joanne, Joan? Shit, I've been calling her Joan the whole video and it's spelled in a way where it can be Joan or Joanne. Tony's wife, Adrian's stepmother, said of this, and I quote, the law says that juveniles can't get more than 40 years. Harley Quinn was no 12 or 14 year old. Harley Quinn was less than a year of being of age because she was 17 at the time. Harley said during this new sentencing hearing, and I quote, I was a child and all I'm asking the court to do is recognize the child that I was. Harley then addressed Adrian's family directly saying, and I quote, if I could give my life, I would. 
I'm sorry. I know it doesn't make any difference. I know you'll never forgive me, and I never ask because I don't deserve it. Which, true, you don't. And something that I, a statement that I quite liked, a little fact that I quite liked, is I guess Harley also said something to the fact that they want to do whatever they can in this life so that when they move on to the next life, they can like look Adrian in the eye, right? Like they can be a good enough person to look Adrian in the eye for what they did. And Adrian's father, Tony, said something to the effect of, well, I'm pretty sure you're going to hell. So you're not going to see her anyway. And I was like, burned. So anyway, the judge who heard this new sentencing hearing, um, his name was Peter Church. He said that the court was, quote, duty bound to uphold the original sentence. So Harley Quinn ended up getting the exact same sentence that they had gotten at their first trial. Oh, also, I don't know if this is still going on, but Harley was trying to write a book and was asking for donations um, in order to get it published, saying that this was, quote, their only passion left in life. But Adrian's mother was actively trying to get people not to donate to it, do to it, to the book publishing, not to donate for that to happen. Um, because essentially like this person doesn't deserve to have any good things in life. I don't know if that was her position, but that's what I imagined her reasoning was. Um, because like, why should you get to have passion and wonderful things in your life when you literally murdered a 16 year old child? I thought like some people were like, oh, your position might change when you're a parent. Da, 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 da. Now that I'm a parent, I feel like I'm even more like you kill my kid. You can fuck yourself. You know what I mean? Like that's my most important person. Like my pride and joy, the tiniest love of my life. And if somebody ever did anything to him, I'm not going to be like that big person who's like, I forgive you. Like, no, you can fuck yourself and die. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So Sarah also tried to request a new sentencing hearing. And this request was dismissed in 2020 with the judge who dismissed it saying that Sarah was quote, a cold and callous person that cannot be rehabilitated. She has now petitioned the state of Illinois for clemency. And that hearing was meant to take place in April of 2022. But thus far, I do not see an update on her hearing. So if there is an update, um, by the time I upload this, I'll put like a pinned comment. I believe this video is going up at the end of June, beginning of July, I'm filming it in May. At the, t the day that I'm filming, this is actually the day that I uploaded my update video for you guys saying that I wasn't going to do more of a makeup as much, but yet here I am doing more of a makeup. So, I mean, I don't know if that's how it's always going to be, but that's how it is right now. So I guess I'm just a big old liar. I don't know. <laughs> now, Nathan, you remember how I told you Nathan said to say was going to piss you off? Well, good old Nathan served a whopping four years for concealment, which concealment was cutting up Adrian's dead body and helping hide it Four years and was released from a juvenile detention center in 2008. Now, four years later in 2012, he actually died. He was 23 years old at the time and him and I believe it was two or three other 23 year olds. I think they were all 23. It was like a group of young dudes died um, after they smashed the car they were in into a tree on a rural road, rural road in Indiana. Adrian's family was questioned after Nathan died, like to see how they felt knowing that one of the people who were involved in the, in their child's murder and dismemberment had died. And they said they felt no joy in learning that he had died. Adrian's father, Tony said that he didn't feel good about it, but that he didn't necessarily feel bad about it either, which I think is, pretty honest and relatable. Tony's position was essentially just that he felt bad for Nathan's family, not really Nathan, but Nathan's family. And he said of this and of Nathan's death. And I quote, some might say what comes around goes around, but that's ugly. And I don't want to hurt his family. They're hurting enough. Apparently when he was talking about what goes around comes around specifically what he was talking about, um, based on the context in the article I read was the fact that Adrian was murdered and then her body burned when she had just moved to an area, just trying to get her life back together and trying to get things back on track. And the exact same thing had happened to Nathan. He had gotten out of jail. He was in a new area. He was trying to get his life back in order and on track. And he was killed in a fiery car wreck. 
Tony said in an interview um, five years after Adrian was killed, it was a like he was being interviewed for the five year anniversary and remembering Adrian. And he said, and I quote, I loved her and I miss her and I like talking about her. We took flowers to the cemetery today and I probably go there more than I should but it makes me feel good when I see someone else has been there too. So if you live in that area, I think it would be a pretty cool thing if you went and like put flowers at her grave. I wish I did because that would be pretty cool to be able to leave something for her and let Tony see that people do still think about her and remember her and know what happened to her and care what happened to her, you know? Tony also said of his mindset of remembering what happened to Adrian that day in 2005 and how he felt. And he said, and I quote, five years ago, I never thought she ran away, but I didn't think she was dead. Some days it still feels like that nightmare. The family has left Adrian's room exactly how she left it that day, just sort of adding things over the years, gifts, cards, they've like laminated news stories and left them there. And Joan, her stepmother said of this and this sort of shrine they've kept for Adrian, and I quote, I sometimes think we should clean it out, put it all away. Then I wonder if that is letting her go. Adrian's family started the Adrian Lee Reynolds Memorial Fund after her death with the GED that Adrian was trying to get at the time of her death in mind. Um, they said that getting her GED was super important to Adrian because she wanted to be able to get into the Marines and she had to have gotten her GED in order to do so. And her family knows that a lot of kids want their GED and can't get it because they can't afford to like take the test. So they started this fund. And as of 2010, 66 students were able, were able to get their GED due to this memorial fund. Now I want to end this video with one more quote from Tony. This is a, um, a little poem that he wrote. And I think it's a very sweet way to send off this video and a sweet thing that he wrote in memory of his daughter. And that was, and I quote, you were dealt to be my daughter. I was dealt to be your dad. And no matter how the game turned out, you are the best hand I ever had. P.S. I love you and I'm proud to be your dad. And with that quote, that my friends is the story of the horrible murder of 16 year old Adrian Reynolds. Isn't that just so fucked up? This was such like a difficult case to look into. It was such a gnarly one just to like read all of that and to think about Adrian and to think about what her final moments were like. And for such a stupid reason, for literally no reason, truly though, there was just no point to it. It was all just like jealousy and obsession and possession that just spiraled into this giant fucking horrible tornado of bullshit. And in the end, Adrian's life was stolen from her and so many other people's lives were were ruined because of it. It ruined all the lives of all the people who loved Adrian. It ruined the lives of all the people who loved her, her murderers. These were kids as well. You know, that when you're still that young, you have so many people in your life that still care about you, right? You haven't like outgrown a bunch of people and most people in your life are still alive. You know what I mean? And so they ruined all these people's lives as well. And I read that this happened on Sarah's grandma's birthday and that they had like gone and seen her during this time to like visit her for her birthday. And then she had to know that they had just killed somebody at the same time on her birthday. So like that was never the same for her either. That day was ruined for her as well, which obviously, obviously that's not as bad as what Adrian's family is going through, but it's, it's still like so many victims are created. Something like this spreads so far. It doesn't just stick to the people that it happens to. The ripple effect goes far and wide and it goes farther and wider than anybody realizes. And so many people's lives are touched and affected and ruined because of things like this and all for nothing, for something so stupid. I just hate it. But now that you've heard all of the details, I come back to the question of the day. And that is, do you think the sentences that these two, these three, were given were just, do you think they were unconstitutional or do you think that they were too light? Um, let me know down below what you think of the sentencing. Cause I'm very curious to hear all the different opinions on this. So now come gather around and let me tell you the story of the tragic murder of 17 year old Michelle Missy Avia. Michelle Avia, who went by the nickname Missy was born on February 8th, 1968 in Los Angeles, California. 
Missy lived with her mother, Irene, and her three brothers, Ernie, Chris, and Mark, and they lived in Arlita, which is a neighborhood in Los Angeles, California. She had a father, obviously, but her mother and father were divorced at one point, and I'm not sure how involved he really was in her life after that, just simply because there are hardly any interviews or quotes with him about Missy's death, um, but that could just be that he's private again. I'm not so sure what his relationship was, so we're just gonna, we're just gonna put him to the side and be like, okay, he was here maybe, maybe he wasn't, I don't know. Moving on. Growing up, Missy was known as being a very well-liked girl from even a young age. She was popular, she was fun to be around, and she was very pretty, both physically and in her personality. She was just that girl who had like something about her, the it factor, something that pulled you in. Boys wanted to be near her, girls wanted to be her. And, and uh, some girls I'm sure wanted to, to be with her as well. I don't know, but you get the sentiment. Although Missy was very popular and had a, a multitude of friends, there was no uh, lack of friends in Missy's life growing up. She did have one main best friend, as many girls do uh, in junior high and high school, pretty much throughout their whole life. I know I still have a very best friend. And this is a girl that she met very young, a girl named Karen Severson. Or Severson? Severson. Severson. Karen and Missy met when they were both only eight years old, and the two were totally inseparable from that time on. They were always together from the day they met. Apparently, the day that they met, it was the day that Missy and her family actually moved into the area. And Missy had this cat, right? And this cat was like, fuck this, and then dipped and got lost. So Missy was out looking for the cat and she saw Karen. So she walked over and asked if Karen had seen this elusive, elusive cat. And she was like, no, but you know what I can do? I can help you find this cat. So the two looked for the kid together. Now, I'm sorry. I know if you're like me, your first thought is, what happened to the cat? Did they find the cat? And I'm sorry to say that I could not find any information on whether or not they found this elusive cat. But what they did find that day was a long lasting and very strong friendship. They were more than best friends. They were like those types of best friends that are like family. They were always together. They were always with each other's families. They were close with each other's parents. They were inseparable. They always stood by each other and stood up for each other in the face of any obstacles at school. They'd just grown up together, you know? They grew up on the same block, they dressed the same Barbies, they listened to the same bands, they flirted with the same boys. They were just each other's number one. That was until the girls turned 14. At 14 years old, Karen actually got pregnant. So she was gonna be a teen mama. And because of this, like, things changed a little bit. Karen ended up dropping out of school so that she could give birth. And with the distance between the two and like Karen being really busy having some other things to do and Missy, you know, wanting to do 14 year old girl things, the two had a totally normal and natural and common growing out process. They, it was kind of an out of sight, out of mind thing. And I mean, I feel like we've all been there where something happens in your teenage years and a friend that you were really close with, just all of a sudden you're not as close with because you're going down very different paths. But this was said to have been very hard for Karen because, okay, and I'm, I'm going to be sympathetic for 14 year old Karen at this moment because that would be very hard, right? Becoming a teenage mother, like one, kudos to her. I don't know how anyone or kudos to anyone who does that because I don't know how anyone could do that because I, 33 years old, I'm about to have a baby and I feel like a baby having a baby. You know what I mean? So I can't imagine doing it at 14 and seeing your life change so much in those years that are supposed to be like formative and fun. So it's a lot. And Karen was also just like the kind of friend who was always a little bit obsessed with Missy. She was very much the type of friend that didn't want her friends to have other friends. We all know those people. Um, you just wanted this person all for yourself. So to see the distance growing between them and to see her moving on and making new friends and like getting boyfriends and not seeing her as much was really hard. She'd like try to invite Missy over and try to get her to come to her house because she wasn't really going out because she had a little baby. And it was just hard for them to make plans because Missy was moving on and making new friends and she always seemed to be busy. And this was hard for young Karen. But with that said, if you know this story, I think we can collectively say, fuck Karen. So the two girls aren't as close. They're growing apart. Missy is making new friends, meeting boys, and everything's cool and everything's civil, right? Okay, great, great story. This, the end. No, that's not the end. So Missy starts dating this guy named 
Randy. And Randy is like some super hot party guy. And at first Missy's all about it, but then she's like, eh, this isn't really for me. He's kind of a bit too much. So they break up. The relationship's really short. It only lasts a, a, a one month. It only lasted one month. The two broke up and everything was fine. Everything was cool. No big deal. Except that like right after Missy and Randy broke up, Randy got a new girlfriend and guess who he started dating? Karen. Missy's they're still friends at this point. They're just not as close. They're still probably calling each other best friend. They're just not really talking as much anymore. And he starts dating her. And he wasn't even like mildly dating her. The two ended up moving in together, Randy and Karen. Now I have two things, two things. One, are these like actual children in high school? Why are you babies moving in together? But two, not cool Karen. Friends do not date friends' ex-boyfriends. Ex-boyfriends are just off limits to friends. That's like the rules of feminism, right? Now, this did not go over well, as I'm sure some of you can imagine. I'm sure there's some of you that are kind of like, what's the big deal? They were broken up. It didn't work out. It was a short relationship, etc., etc. But coming as coming from the position, the point of view, the perspective of a girl who was once in high school and had something similar like this happen to her, it can be a big deal. It can suck. It does and can feel like a betrayal. And it's just like not the nicest thing to do. There are a jillion fish in the sea. Why do you got to go for your ex, for your friend's ex fish? You know what I'm saying? Like that's not the nicest thing. So by this time, Michelle's in high school and she's going to San Fernando High and she's starting to get into a little more trouble. She's starting to get rebellious since she was just a teenager, you know? She was hanging out with a more rowdy crowd, a more troublesome group. She had been skipping classes and getting into a little bit of trouble at school. So she actually ended up getting kicked out of her high school and sent to an alternative school. And I hadn't really heard of an alternative school, but I imagine it's like a continuation school. And this school was San Fernando Mission. And she was sent there to finish off her years. And if you don't know what these things are and you've never heard of these types of schools, it's, it's not as big of a deal as it sounds like it is. I actually was sent to a continuation school in high school to finish off my years as well, because some kids just are a bit of a handful and like to fuck around and need a little more structure and like sit the fuck down and do your schoolwork and stop being a little asshole, you know? It's it's not uncommon. Anyways, guess who else ended up at this freaking continuation school, dude? Freaking Karen, bro. Apparently, after her baby was born and got a little bit bigger, Karen went back to school and she ended up also being sent to the same continuation school. And I don't know if the two were really as close of friends then. I think they were still like civil adjacent and kind of being friends, but they definitely weren't as close as they used to be. And it was while at the school that both girls ended up reuniting with another friend that they had who ended up at the school. This was an 18 year old girl named Laura Doyle. And they both were friends with this girl and had known her since they were eight years old. They had all grown up on the same block. Again, it's not clear to me at this point, if the two girls, if Karen and Missy had, you know, decided to be friends, if they had squashed their beef, if they had buried their hatchet, if you will, but they were both friends with Laura. Laura was like that mutual, um, person in the group of three, which we've already talked about, about, about how groups of three with teenage girls is, um, in trouble. But either way, they did spend time with Laura, either all together as a group, probably awkwardly or independently. Karen said of her relationship with Missy at this point, and I quote, even when I was back at school, I saw less of Missy. It really hurt. I felt like she dropped me. I'd always been there for her, her loyal protector. So I turned on Missy. I found another girl, Laura Doyle, who didn't like Missy either. Once, I would have defended her, but now I joined in on the cruelty. Either way, the, uh, the tension was there and the fans of tension's flame would be the fans of tension's flame. The flames of tension would be fanned when Karen and Missy were both at a party, right? They're at the same party. They're hanging out. They're having a good time. I don't know if they were hanging out together. If they were hanging out separate, but they were both there. You know who else was there? Randy. Karen's boyfriend, Missy's ex. And you know what Randy does? He straight up openly flirts with Missy. He goes as far as to like grab her and pull her down on his lap and tell her how much he misses her. And she's like, you guy, like, I don't want this. You're dating my friend. Don't be such a loser. And Missy even went to Karen and told her everything that happened, told her like, this guy fucking sucks. You should dump him. Like he's a loser. And Karen, instead of being like, wow, yeah, he's sound like he fucking sucks. She got mad 
at Missy instead of at her deadbeat loser ass boyfriend. And I have a serious problem with this. I've told you guys this before in a video. I can't remember which one I mentioned it in, but like, you gotta like properly direct your anger when it comes to these situations, especially when it comes to like cheating and things like that. So often you see that a man cheats on his partner and the girl gets mad at the person he cheated with instead of the man who promised her he'd be faithful to her. And I just find that always to be, always to be, I often find that to be rather dumb. In this situation, it's a little bit different. Like if Missy was cheating with a, with Randy, I could see how Karen would be rightfully mad at both of them because this was her friend, but that wasn't the situation here as far as we know. Like Randy just pulled her into his lap, so it's misdirected anger at Missy, but anyways. All this tension that these two girls had ended up coming to a head one day when they got into like a fist fight at a local park. Apparently they had been there, I don't know what was said, but all of a sudden they start getting into a fight that has Karen getting the upper hand. She like knocks her to the ground, is punching her over and over, and then like threatens to beat her in the head with a beer bottle. It got really messy. So the two were not really friends at this point. They hadn't seen each other in a while. At the After this fight, they didn't see each other for an entire month. And then Missy died. And that was very odd for them because they typically spent a lot of time together. So this is like the longest they had gone without really communicating. But like, would you want to still be friends with your friend if you got in like a fist fight and they were gonna beat a beer bottle over your head? Probably not. I mean, maybe. I don't know what you're into, but I wouldn't. I would take the friendship L and be like, well, it was fun while it lasted, but this is unhealthy. You do your thing. I do my thing. Later, player. I want nothing but good things for your life, but I want you to experience those good things over there away from me. Oh, and previous to that, I didn't even freaking think about this. Like, Karen was so mad at Missy that, okay, Karen went over one day to Missy's family's house when Missy wasn't there so that she could sit and talk with her mother. And I don't really think that that's weird, um, personally, because my best friend, definitely, when, like, we all lived in the same state, would hang out with my mom without me. That wasn't uncommon. They had their own relationship because she was, like, family. She is, like, family. That's still my best friend. Um, and that's what Karen and Missy's mother were like too. They were like family. So one day she went over and was talking to Missy's mother, Irene, without Missy there. But she was like talking mad shit on Missy to her own mother's face. And as I'm sure you can imagine, Missy's mother like wasn't fucking having it. And she said of her conversation, this particular conversation with Karen, and I quote, she said, my daughter took everybody's boyfriend away and that she was just a big flirt. I just told her, if you're not going to talk right, just get out. So on October 2nd, 1985, Missy Avia told her mother that she was going to be spending that day with her friend, Laura. Laura was going to be picking her up. They were going to be gone the whole day. They were going to go to the park, same park where Missy had recently fought Karen. Um, but it wasn't a big deal. This wasn't uncommon. This is a place that Irene said that Missy and her friends went all the time. So around 3.30 PM, Missy said goodbye to her mother. She got in the car and she headed off with Laura Doyle. And this would be the last time that Irene would ever see her daughter alive again. Irene said of that horrible night after her daughter left, and I quote, I stayed up all night with that front door open to see if my daughter was coming home. And she never did. But now we're going to backtrack before she knew that her daughter was missing. And that was when she first got an indication that something may be wrong. And that was at about 6 p.m. when her phone rang. She picked up the phone and who was on the other end of the phone? But Laura Doyle. And Laura was asking to speak to Missy on the phone. And Irene was like, what the fuck are you talking about, Laura? Missy just left with you a couple of hours ago and she said she was going to be with you all day. So why would you be calling for her? And this is when Laura told Irene a very interesting, inventive, and odd story. Laura tells Irene that yes, they did plan to spend the whole day together, that they were going to go to the park, that it was going to be a really great time, but that on the way they were going to the park and Laura needed to stop for gas. But Missy just simply could not wait and needed Laura to drop her off at the park first and then to go get the gas by herself after. And so that's what she did, that she went, she dropped her off at the park and then she left to get her gas, which is odd. Now, why would Missy really, really want to get to the park like immediately? Why couldn't she wait? just to go for a quick trip of gas. Like that seems like a pretty quick errand. Well, Laura tells Irene, 
When I got her to the park to drop her off, there was a car there, a blue Camaro with a couple of guys in it that Missy was meeting up with. So the reason she was in such a hurry to get to the park is because she was meeting a boy there. So Laura dropped Missy off. She went, she met up with the boys in the Camaro. They were having a great time with their blue Camaro. And Laura left to go get the gas. She went, she got the gas, she headed right back. But when she got there, Missy, the boys, and the blue Camaro were just gone. So as Irene's quote would indicate, she sat up that whole night waiting for her daughter to come home with the door open. And when Missy still had not returned home by morning, her mother went in and filed a missing persons report. Just days later, any hope that Missy's family had of finding her, bringing her home safe, of this just being a big misunderstanding, was destroyed when hikers found Missy's body. She was located in the woods at Colby Canyon, which was in the Los Angeles National Forest. Where she was found was an area that was only accessible by foot, where there was a small clearing with a bunch of large rocks around a creek. It was covered in cigarette butts and beer bottles and other trash, and it was a place where the girls would frequently go to drink beer and party, and it was about 45 minutes from her home and where she was last seen alive. Missy was found face down in the stream. She had been drowned in ankle deep water. Uh, her hair, which was like long, dark auburn hair, had been hacked off in chunks at her scalp. And she, she was, so she was laying face down in the stream and there was a large log. It was like a four foot, hundred pound log that was holding her face down into the stream. Missy Avia was only 17 years old. So police started to investigate quickly, but Irene, Missy's mother, could not just like sit back and wait for them to handle the investigation. She had to do things herself. She, she had to be out there doing everything she could in her power to find her daughter's murderer. So she literally would go out all the time driving around looking for this blue Camaro, stopping blue Camaros and asking the people to get out of their cars. And in hindsight, she says she feels bad about that because she was hassling innocent people, but this is the only thing she had to go on. And every step of the way, Karen and Laura, Karen or Laura, not always both of them, usually Karen, but Laura as well, were right by her side, going with her to, to, to search all the cars, just staying right by her to make sure that they could be there and be there to support her and um, make sure that they were active members of the investigation. Both Karen and Laura did go to Missy's funeral. Obviously they were good friends and they needed to show their support. Um, Laura also sent Missy's mother a sympathy card that had $20 in it, which I, I didn't really understand. Maybe that's a thing. I don't know. And in the card, it said that, you know, Laura was so heartbroken about what happened to Missy and that, you know, Irene wasn't just Missy's mother, but her mother as well fucking bitch is what she is. Sorry, but not sorry. And as far as Karen goes, according to Irene, Karen and her daughter like moved in to Missy's family home. Uh, in interviews after the fact, Karen says that this is not what happened, that she didn't move into the family home. But that's what uh, Irene, Missy's mother says happened. Either way, she was definitely there a lot. She definitely made herself known. And Missy's family said that Karen became just like, obsessed with the case and with Missy and that she was devastated and that she would often go to, to Missy's grave. And that at Christmas time, she even brought a Christmas tree to Missy's grave, the cemetery where Missy was buried. And that she would often go to the place in the woods where Missy's body was found. And that she even like straight up had like a murder board up on the wall with like the red string and the fucking pictures and the thumbtacks, just trying to solve the murder. Missy's mother, Irene, said of Karen during this time, and I quote, I trusted Karen so much. We all trusted her. She was my daughter's best friend. They grew up together. That girl was part of my family. Karen used to see me every day and saw the hell that I was going through. Despite everyone's best efforts, the police really had no information to go on. They couldn't find any suspects like any real like good leads. And the case went cold for two years. So for those entire two years, police had only heard the one story from Laura that, you know, Laura dropped Missy off at the park, that she was there with the boys in the blue Camaro, that she left. And when she came back, they were just nowhere to be found. But after two years, 
Laura changed her story, and now she was telling police that she didn't drop Missy off at the park, that she had actually dropped Missy off at a church, okay? And the reason that she didn't bring this information sooner to police was that she didn't want to get in trouble because what was happening at that church involved a drug deal. I can't imagine what police were thinking at this point because it's just such a wild, wild, wildly different story. But regardless of this, police looked into this one as well, and this tip produced no leads, no real suspects. And again, the case went cold for another year. So now it's three years. It was in July of 1988 that police got their first real lead that led them to an arrest. And this is when a girl came forward to give them some information. A girl named Eva Trombolo. And this girl's name is Trumbolo. And I don't know why that's like the cutest thing I've ever heard in my life. Is that from Pinocchio? Trumbolo. I think it is. Now, Eva told police a very interesting story. She said that that day in 1985, when Missy was picked up by Laura and driven out to the park, you know, or the church or whatever Laura was saying, that it, Laura and Missy weren't really alone, that Eva was there too, kind of. She said that when Laura picked Missy up, they were alone in Laura's car, that part was true. But that Eva was following behind Laura and Missy in her car. Now why in the world would she do that? Well, alongside her in her car, that was following Laura and Missy in Laura's car, was Karen. Story's heating up now, right? Seems like things are getting a little too spicy for the pepper. That's what I'm saying. Eva then told police that the group ended up at the area where Missy's body was later found and that Missy, Karen, and Laura all got out of the car and walked off into the woods together and Eva stayed in the car waiting for them. <sighs> Eva then told police an interesting story. She told police that that day, all of them had driven up to the area where Missy's body would later be found. That when they got there, Missy, Karen, and Laura all got out of the car and they walked out into the forest and Eva stayed and waited at the car. She didn't really know what was happening according to her. She said that she doesn't know if Missy knew what was happening. She doesn't know if Missy even knew that they were following behind in their car, but that they all walked up into the forest together. And after some time, Karen and Laura came back but Missy never did. Now, why didn't Eva come forward sooner? I'm not really sure. She has said that she was scared. She was scared of getting in trouble for her part in the case. She was scared of what Laura and Karen may do to her um, in light of her betrayal if she did go forward. Either way, she didn't. Um, and what actually ended up really pushing her in the direction of coming forward and like the thing that really broke her was the death of her own brother. Her 18 year old brother ended up committing suicide, which is just like so fucking sad, man. It's always, I, that said really, really gets me. Um, but she said after that happened, the pain that she felt really solidified in her something. And it was that, imagine what Missy's family was going through, not even knowing who had killed her. And anyways, she said that this was too much for her and it's what broke her because it was too much pain for her to bear. But there's also rumors that have been reported that rumors started going around the neighborhood that Eva was involved because there were rumors that Missy had been messing around with Eva's boyfriend as well at the time. So it's really unsure what pushed her to come forward, but she did. And in her coming forward, police were able to finally make an arrest in her murder, in, in Missy's murder, clearly is what I meant. <laughs> So naturally upon hearing this from Eva, police go right to the source and they go to Karen and they're like, okay, this is what we heard. What the fuck? And this is when Karen finally, for the first time is honest about what happened that day. Karen tells police that her, Missy and Laura walked off into the woods together while Eva wait waited in the car. So exactly the same as Eva's accounting of what happened that day. She said that the girls were walking for a while and that they were kind of like forcing her to go. They were bullying her as she said. And then at some point, Missy got so exhausted and so upset that she, they had to stop and she like sat down on a rock and was just crying. And that the girls then grabbed her hair and started chopping off chunks of her hair 
as I said, those big hunks of her hair that were missing. And the whole time Missy just cried and cried and screamed and asked them like, why, why are you doing this to me? And they told her that they were doing this because she was like this and a whore and was stealing the girl's boyfriends, supposedly. It's just so fucking stupid. They said they then got her up and they continued walking until they came to the creek. And that's when Laura was like, oh, Missy, like, come get in the creek with me. And I'm sure it was in like a very creepy, like, like threatening way because of what they had already done to her. And obviously she's like, no, I don't want to fucking do that. Obviously. Um, but regardless, Karen pushed Missy into the water with Laura. The girls then grabbed Missy and tied her hands behind her back and then started pushing her head into the water. Laura, um, was, you know, pushing her head into the water and Karen then, um, helped dislodge that log, that four foot, 100 pound log before she said that she got out of the water and just turned her back and left and left Laura and Missy alone, knowing full well that Laura was planning to murder Missy. So with this story, the girls were arrested, obviously. And when Irene, Missy's mother, found out about the arrests, she said, and I quote, it was like somebody punched me in the stomach. I was shocked. I walked towards my room and passed out. The girls were charged with murder, kidnapping, false imprisonment, and aiding in the commission of a felony. Karen was held without bail and Laura was held at a million dollar bail, but obviously didn't post bail, so she stayed in jail. Karen claimed that the girls never intended to kill Missy initially. That was never part of her plan, that they were just going to take her out there and like bully her and beat her up a bit and torment her because they were so angry with her and jealous of her, but that they never intended to actually murder her that day. After the arrest, the real truth about Missy and Karen's friendship became more well known to everyone who uh, was interested in the case. Many people who knew both girls said that Karen was very obsessive and also very, very jealous all around of Missy, that Missy was considered the prettier one, the more popular one, the one that just sort of had like an ease in life and just simply was herself, where Karen wasn't seen the same. She was seen as like a little less pretty, like a larger girl, and that she had to always kind of try to prove who she was to people and didn't have the same ease through life as Missy did. Missy's family kind of believes this as well and thinks even farther that in killing her, she was trying to then take over Missy's life. And that's why after doing so, she moved in with Missy's family and was like there to console them and like stay in her house and live where she lived. And it's just because again, Missy and Karen were seen as complete opposites personality wise and physically. Missy was petite at only five, two and only 90 pounds. And she would often get a ton of attention from all the boys in the area. And, and Karen was taller and considered by her peers to be a little overweight. And we all know what Dick's kids can be. And in addition to that, it seems that Karen may have been jealous of Missy's life as a whole, as seeing her as this like very beautiful, happy, wonderful girl coming from a whole and loving family, even though her parents were divorced. So it wasn't like this whole family structured unit. That's how Karen saw it because Karen was actually adopted. Um, and though her parents literally went out and chose her, they wanted a baby to love and to hold and to cherish. And they went out and chose her specifically and loved her fierceful, fiercely, fiercely, fiercely. She still felt um, unwanted and rejected by her birth parents where Missy didn't have birth parents reject her. It does seem like Karen was probably having trouble um, dealing with the guilt of what she did, whether she felt bad or she was worried about getting caught. I'm not sure, but she did start heavily drinking. And due to that, she gained like a good amount of weight and she was drinking all the time. And Irene, um, Missy's mother even asked Karen, like, are you okay? Why are you drinking so much? Cause like she would see it because Karen was literally staying in her house and Karen was just, would just say, you know, I lost my best friend. And apparently Laura was having a hard time with it too. And she seemed to be struggling just as bad as Karen did. She wasn't shoving herself in um, Missy's family's faces as much as Karen was, but her mother, Missy's mother said of Laura and her demeanor after the murder. And I quote, she came over here a couple of times, all depressed. She said she wanted to kill herself because she was the last person to see Missy alive. When they told me that it was Karen and Laura, I didn't believe the cops. I couldn't believe it. 
I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. So during the trial, Laura Doyle's ex-boyfriend testified against her and he testified that a month before the murder, a month before Laura and Karen took her up to those freaking woods and drowned her in ankle deep water, that Laura had threatened to murder Missy. He said his name was Victor and Victor said that, okay, whew, I'm going too fast. Victor was Laura's ex-boyfriend. Victor was also Missy's ex-boyfriend. Missy had dated him first and Laura had dated him after. And it seems like maybe these girls would not be so jealous of their friend if they would stop dating their friend's exes. Because obviously these boys were into her enough to date her at one point. So they're clearly attracted to her. Maybe this would have solved some problems. But anyway, anyways, uh, Victor and Laura had been dating and he actually ended up breaking up with her because she was too jealous of a person. Apparently she was incredibly jealous, incredibly possessive. No matter what girl he would talk to, she would like lose her shit. And she was particularly pissy. Um, and jealous of him talking to Missy. So he broke up with her. And then about six weeks before the murder, he was at his house and apparently Missy was there too. And Laura showed up unexpectedly. She was just driving by and happened to see them. She says she saw them kissing. I don't know if that's true. It hardly matters, but she got pissed. She got out of her car. She starts screaming. She starts fighting with both Missy and Victor and going at it. And he's like, you know what? Get out of here. This is my house. Just leave. Like, don't be here. And she said at that time, I'll kill the bitch. Apparently though, this wasn't taken seriously because Laura was just like a very intense person, especially where her boyfriends were concerned. She was the type that would even like carve their initials into her skin and shit. So who knows? Because clearly Missy still trusted her enough to go and hang out with her after this, which sucks, but you don't expect that your friends are going to fucking murder you. The prosecutor said during the trial of Missy and I quote, her only problem, at least on that fateful day, was that she was very popular with the boys and this drove Laura Doyle and Karen Severson crazy. In March of 1990, both Karen and Laura were found to be guilty of second degree murder and they were both given 15 years to life in prison and they would both be eligible for parole in only seven years. Initially, the prosecution wanted to go for first degree murder, but they were not able to convince a jury that this was premeditated and that the girls did go there with the intention and the plan of murdering Missy. The prosecution said of the murder, and I quote, our position was that this crime was a deliberate, well-planned torture and execution of Missy and needed to be treated as such. Karen served 23 years of her sentence and was released in December of 2011 at age 45. Her daughter was raised by her parents during her time in jail. Irene said of Karen's release, and I quote, I wish that girl would die. I feel bad for my sons. I feel bad for everybody who knew her. This was a terrible injustice, a terrible injustice. I don't understand why people who commit murder, they let them out. I can't sleep. I can't think. I can't eat. It's been 26 years. It feels like yesterday. Not one day, not one minute, not one second do I not think about Missy. People say it's been 10 years, 20 years. I don't care if it's 50 years. I'll never get over my daughter. Missy's brother, Chris, said of his sister, and I quote, I remember her being outgoing, loving, and trusting everybody. And that was her downfall. Laura Doyle was released in December of 2012 and she too was 45 years old and she had only served 22 years of her sentence. Missy's mother, Irene said of Laura's release and Laura as a person. And I quote, I hate her. I hate her. I hate her. She did nothing but damage my life. Both should have suffered the death penalty. They are free. My daughter is in the ground. And we often see so many parents and so many family members be like, positive and diplomatic and political and just like, so like, and I never understand it. And this is the type of energy and feeling that I can at least relate to personally. Cause I feel like I would be the same way. I would be like, fuck these bitches. I wish they were dead. I don't care about them. Sorry, not sorry. They murdered my 17 year old daughter. Like, I feel like that's how I would feel. So I get Irene. Now I couldn't find anything online about Laura and where she is now or anything like that. It seems like she stayed pretty under the radar upon her, her being released, but not Karen. Okay. 
Karen went on to write books. She's now a published author who presents at high schools in the U.S. talking about the dangers of bullying. She wrote and released two books about Missy's murder. At the time that Karen wrote her first book, she was quoted as saying that she was going to donate some, but not all, nev never all, of the proceeds of that book to anti-bullying campaigns. And when asked why she wasn't going to donate all of the proceeds, she said, and I quote, I didn't say everything. I have to live. It's hard to get a job out there. Karen was then asked like how she'd respond to someone who said that there are like other ways to make money besides writing a story about the girl you murdered. And she said to this, she responded to this and I quote, like what? Sell myself? The idea that Karen could profit in any way um, from the murder of Missy pissed her family off so much. And they said, and I quote, she keeps damaging us over and over and over. Well, it's going to stop today. Missy's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Karen, and then they also filed a lawsuit against Karen and the book's distributor for inflicting, inflicting emotional distress on the family. We're filing a lawsuit against a vicious killer who has been profiting off her crime. It's not about us making money off this lawsuit. It's about letting the public know that crime is paying in California. And that quote was by Missy's sister-in-law. In addition to the civil lawsuit, Missy's family was pushing for legislation in the state that they would call Missy's Law, and it was intended to help family members of crime victims recoup money from a perpetrator who has profited from a book or movie deal based on their crime. Missy's mother said of this law, and I quote, This law should have been passed a long time ago. It's like you're giving them an award for killing somebody. And Missy's family was successful, and Missy's Law was past, which is awesome. Cause I feel like I knew that that was a thing. I didn't know that this was the case that caused that to be a thing. You know what I mean? Like not being able to profit off <laughs> your murders. Like I always knew that that was a thing, but I didn't know what caused it. And now I do. And now if you didn't, you do as well. Karen has given many interviews since being released. Most popularly, most popularly, is that a word? The most popular of which being an interview she did with Dr. Dr. Fuck. Dr. Phil, you can find this on YouTube. And Dr. Phil asked her like why she went to the funeral and in inserted herself in Missy's family so much. And she said, and I quote, I felt like I had an obligation to Missy's family after what I did. I also wanted to know how the police investigation was going. I wanted to know who the suspects were and what evidence they'd found. So she was very clearly also very interested in self-preservation and not so much the like caring about Missy's family, in my opinion, but I could be wrong, but tell me what you think. And to sort of round this case up, round this case up, close this case up, bring it all in. I'm going to end this with a quote that Missy's mother said that I think sums this case up pretty well and is a good message. And that is, and I quote, all I can say is girls, watch out whom you trust. Come. Gather round and let me tell you the story of the murder of 15-year-old Kirsten Costas, the real-life death of a cheerleader. So let's jump in our handy-dandy time machine and head to 1984 in Orinda, California, just about 30 minutes away from the big city of San Francisco. In 1984, the group of people who lived in this area were people who were, you know, well or off individuals, people who made a pretty good amount of money and they moved here because one, it was expensive. It seemed to have the best schools and a relatively low crime rate, just like the perfect place to raise some good, well-behaved, out of trouble children, if you could afford it. And this is where Kirsten Costas, the subject of today's video, was living at the time of her tragic murder. Kirsten Costas, born July 23rd, 1968, making her a Leo, was the eldest of two children. Her and her brother Pete were raised by their parents, Arthur Costas, who just went by simply Art, and Beret Costas. Art worked as an executive of a corporation and made enough money that Beret could be a stay-at-home mom. They were well enough off that not only could his wife stay home, not needing to work, but he could also afford all the extras his family could ever ask for. Swim clubs, tennis clubs, fancy cars, cheerleading camps, skiing trips, the whole shebang. They were, they're doing well. They're doing well in their lives. In 1984, Kirsten was 15 years old and her mother described her as the energy of the house. While the rest of the, the members of the family were a little more quiet, a little more reserved, Kirsten in typical Leo fashion was just a big ball of energy, always just lighting up a room and making her presence known. 
Kirsten was always talking to friends and listening to music and dancing around, and she was just described as being filled with vibrancy and life. Kirsten was a pretty girl. She was a cute girl. She was thin with olive skin and curly brown hair. She was a varsity cheerleader. She was on the swimming team and the soccer team, and she worked in her school office and had been invited to become a member of the Bobolinks, which was a sort of like volunteer club that had kind of a sorority feel. You know, I don't know. My school didn't have anything like that, but that's the way it was described. In addition to being popular with her peers and her friends, she was also very popular with the boys. But as much as they chased her, she never really dated anyone. Kirsten was just really well-liked, popular, and she was rich. She was from a well-off family, her father being an executive, as I said, so she was always dressed in the best clothes, and she got to go away to cheerleading camp and cool ski vacations. It was the classic girls wanted to be just like her and boys wanted to be with her scenario. Of the girls who seemed to want to be just like Kirsten was another 15-year-old girl named Bernadette Prodi. Bernadette was a fellow 15-year-old girl who attended Miramonte High School alongside Kirsten. Bernadette, like Kirsten, was a member of the swim team, she worked in the school office, and she was also a member of the Bobolinks. Though the two were in several similar groups and clubs and had mutual friends, the two were not really friends, and Bernadette viewed this as Kirsten not really liking her. And she really wanted Kirsten to like her and wanted to be her friend, and based on some of the things that we will later hear from Bernadette, I don't think that's because she particularly liked Kirsten, but because she liked the idea of her and craved acceptance, and that's what Kirsten embodied. She was just overall accepted by everyone, and Bernadette didn't feel like she was. Bernadette was embarrassed of her more modest living. She lived with her sisters and her mother and her father, and her father was a retired public utility supervisor, and though her family had, you know, less fancy things, a less fancy house, and didn't like ball out quite as much as others who lived in the area, she saw it as them being kind of, you know, poor. But this was like, <laughs> this was only in comparison to other people who lived in the area, because everyone who lived in that area was definitely more well off than the average bear. You know what I'm saying? Like, I would look hella poor there. I would, I would look very poor there. Bernadette's family was financially fine. They had enough to get by. They just didn't have all the excess that, you know, other people in the area had. But Bernadette was really unhappy because she was surrounded by all of these really rich, elite girls like Kirsten. And it made her, you know, question her self-worth. And her self-esteem was already super low. In the spring of 1984, Bernadette had tried out for the cheerleading squad alongside Kirsten. And she tried out, like she tried really hard to get into the squad because apparently at this school and this time cheerleading was a BFD, okay? Big deal. Apparently cheerleading was taken very serious, very seriously in the school. And before you could even try out, you had to write an essay telling them why you would be an asset to the squad. And then your parents had to agree to pay for your specialized uniforms and to send you to cheerleading camp. And this cost $500. And this is $500 in 1980s money. It just seems like a lot, right? And then once they tried out, the way that they'd find out that they won, okay, they'd have a whole ass ceremony for this, okay? It's kind of like when you watch old movies, and I don't know if they, my school, they didn't do this. Maybe yours did, let me know. But in movies where somebody's being announced as prom queen, and they have to like, go up on a stage and do a whole thing. Well, these girls would be judged by a group of judges and then they'd have that ceremony and they'd call their names, they'd pull them out of an envelope and call their names and they'd go up on the stage and oh my God, and get flowers for cheerleading. That whole, that just seems very odd to me, but that's how it was. So Bernadette was very, very invested in trying out for the cheer squad. Sadly for Bernadette, she did not make the cheerleading squad, but Kirsten did, being described as the perfect cheerleader, and this made Bernadette take a giant hit to her ego, and she felt incredibly defeated. And if it wasn't bad enough that she didn't get on the cheerleading squad, right after she was also denied a place on the school yearbook. And though these might seem like small potatoes to us, these were things that were incredibly important to Bernadette. Bernadette just never felt like anyone liked her or accepted her. So with every one of her perceived failures, her self-worth went down lower and lower. And with her self-worth going down lower, she felt like people liked her less and less. And acceptance and being liked was incredibly important 
to Bernadette Prati. So now that you have a little bit of a backstory on these girls, let's get in our time machine one more time and head to June of 1984. On the night of June 22nd, 1984, a call came into the Costas household that was answered by Kirsten's mother, Beret. The girl on the phone didn't identify herself, but we know now that it was Bernadette. This call came in at about 10 p.m., but Kirsten was not there to take this call because she was away at cheer camp because as I told you, it was mandatory. If you got into the cheerleading squad, you had to go to cheer camp. So Kirsten wasn't there to take this call. And it turns out that Bernadette knew that Kirsten wouldn't be there to take the call. That's why she called then because she knew that if she had called and actually spoken to Kirsten, Kirsten likely would not have been receptive to this call. Bernadette informed Beret that the next night on June 23rd, she would be picking up Kirsten to go to a secret Bobolinks initiation dinner. And she wanted this to be a surprise. She wanted to surprise Kirsten with this. So she said just to have her ready, have her all dolled up, and that she'd be picking her up the following night. And with this, the call ended. The following night, June 23rd, Beret, Art, and Kirsten's brother Pete were all out of the house at a dinner for Pete. I think it was some sort of sports thing. So Beret called in at the house to say goodnight to Kirsten at about 8.30, saying, you know, I love you have fun. I'll see you later tonight. And then hung up the phone, not knowing that would be the last time she would ever speak to her only daughter. While this was happening, Bernadette Prati was being driven by her father to a house that was not far from her own family home, where she had told her parents she was going to be babysitting that night. Bernadette then convinced her father, who had driven her over that night, to leave the car with her, even though she didn't have her driver's license yet. She said that because she was going to be babysitting alone, that having a car in the driveway would make her feel safer because if there was any sort of burglar or something, they would see a car in the driveway and assume there were adults home. And after a little bit of persuasive, her father agreed to this and walked the short walk home, leaving Bernadette with the family car. Shortly after that, Bernadette arrived at Kirsten's home. And at first, Kirsten was not like totally thrilled to see Bernadette. She was like, oh, it's you. Yikes. But Bernadette then informed her that like, okay, we're not really going to a Bobolinks party. We're going to go to the super cool unsupervised house party. And with a little persuasion, Kirsten got in the car and the two rode off together into the night in Bernadette's family's beat up orangish colored Pinto. What I will now tell you is Bernadette's account of what happened that night. As I said before, the whole reason that Bernadette had made up the story about the Bobolinks having an initiation dinner was a cover for Kirsten's parents so that the two of them could go to that super cool unsupervised house party. And the reason that Bernadette wanted to do this and wanted to like trick Kirsten, get her out of the house to go to this party is because she wanted to finally forge a friendship with Kirsten. On the way to this party, the two ended up pulling over in a church parking lot because Kirsten wanted to smoke a little weed before the party. And it was while parked in this church parking lot that an argument ensued between the two girls that ended in Kirsten telling Bernadette that she was super weird for, you know, lying to get her out of the house, trying to get her to this party and because Bernadette would not smoke with her. Bernadette said that Kirsten made her feel dumb for being a square and not wanting to smoke with her. And then Kirsten got out of the car to try to find her own way home. Bernadette then saw Kirsten walk over to the home of one of Kirsten's family friend's house. This was Mary Jane and Alex Arnold. They were friends of Kirsten's parents. And she knocked on the door and was like, hey, can I make a phone call? I need to call my parents to pick me up. And when the Arnolds looked out, you know, down out, out behind Kirsten, they saw a girl with a roundish face and light brown hair standing behind Kirsten out at the street. When Kirsten was in the house, she first tried to call her parents, but found that they still were not home yet. So she then asked if the Arnolds wouldn't mind giving her a ride home because her friend had gone weird on her. They agreed and Mr. Arnold started to drive Kirsten home. And this is when Bernadette followed behind Mr. Arnold's car in her Pinto. While driving, Mr. Arnold noticed that they were being followed and was like, you know, what's going on? What's up with that? And Kirsten said not to worry. It wasn't a big deal. She didn't seem to be scared or nervous. She just seemed to be a little bit upset. And while Bernadette was following behind Mr. Arnold and Kirsten in the car ahead of her, she casually noticed that inside her car, there was a giant knife. So once Bernadette saw that Kirsten was dropped outside her neighbor's house, she was dropped off at her neighbor's house because her parents weren't home yet. And she didn't want to be home alone. 
Kirsten got out of the car. She took the knife with her. She ran up to Kirsten and she just started stabbing her. So while this was happening, Alex Arnold had parked across the street and was watching Kirsten walk up to the house to wait to make sure she got inside because this is what a good person does. But while sitting there, this is when he saw the attack. At first, Mr. Arnold thought that the girls were just in a fist fight. Like he saw Bernadette run up on her and he saw them start scuffling and he thought they were in a fist fight. But then Kirsten went down to the ground. You know, she's, she's being stabbed. And this is when he saw the shine of the blade and realized that she was in fact being stabbed. But everything happened so fast that Bernadette was done and took off on foot to her car. So Mr. Arnold was like, oh shit, I should probably follow this girl. And he started to follow the Pinto in his car for a short period of time before he realized, oh shit, Kirsten might need help. And he headed back to try to aid injured Kirsten. So this was all happening at just before 10 p.m. And while this was happening, while Mr. Arnold had been chasing Bernadette, another neighbor, a man named Arthur Hillman, had heard Kirsten scream and described it as a blood curdling scream. And he had opened his door to see Kirsten bloody staggering over to him, yelling for help, saying, help me, help me, I've been stabbed. Kirsten then fell into this man's arms and he did everything he could, he could do to try to save her, but it was no use, she was too badly injured and Kirsten's parents arrived home just in time to see her being loaded into the back of an ambulance where she was taken to a hospital and pronounced dead at 11.02 p.m. Kirsten had been stabbed five times in total. Two of the stabs were to her back and of the five, three would have been fatal wounds. There were also defensive wounds on her forearm. When Bernadette got home after committing this murder, she hid the knife. She flushed a baggie of marijuana down the toilet that Kirsten had left in her car. And then she went on a really casual evening walk with her mom and her dog acting like nothing had ever happened. But once she got home, she spent the rest of the night, the rest of the night restless because she says that she didn't realize that she had killed Kirsten. She thought she had just hurt her. So she was waiting for police to show up at her door because clearly Kirsten would have told police who did it. So she waited for police to show up or for a call to come in, but no one showed up and this call never happened. Instead, the next day she received a call from a friend letting her know that Kirsten had been murdered. And that same day she cleaned the knife and replaced it in her kitchen. And shortly thereafter, she disposed of her sweatpants and t-shirt that she had been wearing at the time of the murder. Police worked really hard to try to solve this case, but the only evidence that they had and the only leads that they had was a young girl with light hair and an orangish yellow colored Pinto, but there was no physical evidence and nobody knew who the person was that had called and had gone and picked up Kirsten that night. It took police six months to make an arrest, six months. And what was Bernadette doing during these six months of freedom? Bernadette was acting pretty normal. She was really good at blocking what had happened out of her mind. She took some summer classes. She went to her swim club. She hung out with friends and she even attended Kirsten's funeral, which the audacity, but also she, I guess, you know, had to keep up appearances, but my God, people have the nerve. Play sick that day. You're sick. You can't go to the funeral. You're feeling really sick, right? No, she went. And just a side note, if you ever murder me, do not come to my funeral. The audacity, you're not invited, okay? No. Now, during the six months, what were police doing? During the six month investigation, police searched hundreds of Pintos that matched the description of the car that had followed Kirsten to her neighbor's home that night. Of these cars, they also searched Bernadette's family car, but no evidence was ever found. Thousands of leads were followed and hundreds of people were questioned during the investigation, including a bunch of, you know, teenage girls from Kirsten school, but the police had made no significant progress in whittling down the suspect pool. So local police ended up contacting the FBI's behavioral science unit to try to get a profile made up of the type of person who would have been the killer of Kirsten Costas. And at the time, I don't think this was super common, like um, doing profiling, but you know, that's much more common now. But at the time, I believe that was more of a um, progressive move on the police's part. After getting this profile back from Quantico, local police dwindled down their list and they ended up having a main suspect, Bernadette Prati. But to her friends, like this 
was crazy. There was no way that she would be capable of doing something like this, and she was the last person you would ever think of. Bernadette had been given several interviews already, and she was also given a polygraph test, and I saw conflicting information on what happened in this polygraph test. One said that she flat out failed. One said that it was inconclusive, and then when it was revisited, it was found that some part she probably lied at, and some was still inconclusive, so I couldn't find clarity on what happened in the polygraph test, but anyway. So, police got this profile back, and they decided that they wanted to in speak with Bernadette again, naturally, and when they interviewed her again, they kind of told her what the profile was, and her response to that was, that sounds just like me. Bernadette then asked police what would happen to the guilty party, and she told police then that she believed that the public humiliation of people knowing that the killer had done it would be worse than having to go to prison, which is just like, you know, a totally normal thing for an innocent person to say, right? Somehow, after all that, the police still let her leave, but Bernadette went home and got very in her feelings, and she started to write down how she felt in, in a list form, which, you know what? I bet you this girl was a Virgo. Let me see if this girl was a Virgo. September 20th. Frickin' Virgo. Virgos write lists. I have a Virgo moon. I live on lists. Anyway, her list said, and I quote, Number one, I have caused a lot of hurt and pain to a lot of people. Number two, I don't want to hurt people anymore. Number three, I want to go to heaven when I die. Number four, I regret what I did. Number six, if I kill myself, I will hurt people even more. Quotes, my family. I think I could kill myself. I would go to hell if I killed myself. I would rather kill myself than go on living if people knew. Although it's incredible, my parents are saints who would forgive and love me. Though Bernadette had been good at hiding what had happened and how she had been feeling, the pressure was starting to get to her and after a few days she had finally broke. She was feeling guilty, she knew the police were on to her, and she just couldn't take it anymore. I don't know how anybody can keep a secret like that. I really, I really, really don't. On December 10th, 1984, Kirsten had written a letter confessing what she had done and addressed it to her mother. As she left for school, she left the letter on the counter and she asked her mother, please don't read this until 30 minutes have gone by after I've left. And her mother was like, yeah, cool. I, I wonder what was going through her head at the time, but I'm certain it was not this. The letter read as follows. Dear mom and dad, I have been trying to tell you this all day, but I love you so much, it's too hard, so I'm taking the easy way out. The FBI man thinks I did it, and he is right. I've been able to live with it for a while, but I can't ignore it. It's too much for me, and I can't be that deceiving. Please still love me. I can't live unless you love me. I've ruined my life and yours, and I don't know what to do, and I'm ashamed and scared. Please don't say how could you or why, because I don't understand this and I don't know why. Bernadette's mother then drove right over to her school and picked her daughter up, saying that she just wanted to be with her. She didn't even want to talk to, talk to her about what happened. She just wanted to sit with her and be in her presence because, I mean, she knew what was coming. She wasn't going to have her daughter anymore. After that, Bernadette, her mother, and her father all drove to the police station where Bernadette gave a full confession. Bernadette told police the story that I told you above. She said that she didn't mean to kill Kirsten. She only wanted to hurt her. She said that she was worried that after what happened, Kirsten, who was very popular, would go and tell all of her friends that Bernadette was weird and in effect completely ruin her reputation. And that was a devastating thought to her because she had worked so hard on being popular and well-liked and that's all she wanted. So when Kirsten rejected her, she just snapped and got super angry. And she said that she continued to get more and more angry as she approached Kirsten. Kirsten was like, get away from me, get away from me. And the continued rejection made her even more angry. She said that she can't explain why it happened, why she made the choice that she made. She said that she wasn't in her right mind. And if she had been, she obviously would not have made the choice that she made. But to be honest, it did seem like Bernadette had a little bit of resentment towards Kirsten. She told police that the two of them had been on like a ski trip and that Kirsten had been sort of rude to her and said something that implied that her family was too poor to 
afford to buy her nice skis and nice ski clothes for the trip. And of this comment, Bernadette said, and I quote, it seemed like everyone else was thinking that, but she was the only one who would come right out and say it. And you know, maybe that was true. Maybe Kirsten wasn't very nice to Bernadette. It's possible. I mean, to be honest, 15 year olds are kind of dickheads. Like, sorry, it's just true. You kind of grow out of that as you get older. But even if that is the case, she didn't deserve to die about it. And I feel like I just need to say it because in, in a recent upload of mine, I got a lot of victim blaming and it's like, who raised you? Don't do that. Most of you are pretty cool. Like a lot of you, most of you are pretty cool, but some of you are victim blamers. So just stop it. So I just feel like I need to say that real quick, that even if she wasn't particularly nice to her, she didn't deserve to be stabbed to death outside in the dark, in the cold by herself. I feel like that should be a no brainer, but apparently it's not. Anyways, Bernadette went on to say that she didn't believe that Kirsten ever really liked her and that she really only thought Kirsten was okay. She said the things that really upset her were the things in her life that she could not change, like her looks, her popularity, or her family's financial situation. Of course, police had some questions about this narrative. They were like, okay, 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 sure. Sounds legit, but if you, if you were going to a cool unsupervised house party with a girl that you're trying to convince to be your friend, a real popular girl that you're trying to show that you're cool, why would you go to this party in just sweatpants and a t-shirt? They were like, that doesn't really make sense, but I'm not sure exactly how I feel about this because straight up, if I was going to a house party, I would gladly go in sweatpants and a t-shirt, but this is also 32 year old Brittany talking. 15 year old Brittany would not be caught dead in sweatpants and a t-shirt. She would have been dolled up to the nine. To the nine, is that the phrase? Anyways, and Bernadette was not, but Bernadette was also lying to her family about where she was. They thought that she was going to be babysitting. So maybe if she was to get all dolled up, her parents might suspect that she was lying. I'm not sure about that, but that's what makes me kind of go back and forth on that point it made some people believe that Bernadette was just straight up lying and that she never planned to take Kirsten to a party. And they're like, okay, another question. Why did you have like a big ass knife in your car? Okay. And her explanation for this was that her older sister, who, who was the one who drove the car, because remember Bernadette didn't even have a license. Well, her older sister, Gina, would take the car to work and she would sit in the car on her lunch break. She was a vegetarian and she would cut up her food with this knife. She kept it in the car to cut up her food, fruits, vegetables, things like that. So there was just always this big knife in the car. And apparently at trial, her sister did testify that this was true. Now, even if this was true, which just seems weird to me, I probably wouldn't leave a big ass kitchen knife in my car but you know, that's just me. Um, it doesn't explain why when Bernadette went to pursue Kirsten on foot after getting to the neighbor's house, like why she grabbed the knife from the car. That, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I guess it doesn't necessarily prove premeditation either. So word got out in this small community that an arrest had been made. And because everyone knew of the suspected age range of the perpetrator, they knew it was po possible <laughs> that it was somebody from their school. So everybody made sure to show up at school that day. They didn't want to be absent and be suspected as the potential murderer by their peers. So it didn't take long for people at the school to realize that the person who was absent that day was Bernadette Prati. And it was super weird. Like people were really surprised. Nobody suspected her. She was the last person you would think would do something like this. And she had seemed just as torn up as everybody else about Kirsten's death. So Bernadette was arrested and put on trial. And during the three day trial, she was supported by her mother, her father, and her four sisters. And they all sat together and throughout the trial, they mostly just cried. The prosecution stated that Kirsten was suffering from being rejected and, and embarrassed by her peers and that her murdering Kirsten was premeditated because she wanted to protect her reputation and didn't want anyone to label her as odd or strange and ruin all the groundwork that she had done on becoming a more popular person. And they said that the, the murder was completely premeditated and that she acted with a disregard for human life. I think the prosecution probably went down this road of resentment leading to premeditation because of something that Bernadette said in her confession, because they listened to the confession tape in court um, to corroborate this. And she said, and I quote, 
I lost for cheerleader, I didn't get the club I wanted, and I didn't get on the yearbook staff. The things that got me mad was it hurt, and the things that I could not change, like looks, or money, or popularity, or things. And these were all things that Kirsten did have, which made the prosecution think, or try to spin the narrative, that Bernadette was just incredibly jealous and resentful that Kirsten had these things when Bernadette did not. Though the prosecution was aiming for a first degree murder charge, the judge refused to convict Bernadette of first degree murder because the judge did not believe that the prosecution had proved premeditation. And I don't know if I agree. I go a little back and forth on this one. I wasn't in that courtroom, so I can't know what all evidence was presented. But when I think about the knife, even if the knife was only in the car because her sister used it to cut veggies in the car at lunch, okay, sure. But why did she grab it when she got out of the car? First off, why did she follow Kirsten when Kirsten was getting a ride home there? That's a little bit odd. And the whole drive over, she had a chance to think about what she wanted to do. And what she chose to do was to grab that knife and to get out of the car and to go over and stab her. So I feel like it's a pretty fine line on whether or not that was premeditated. Because even if she didn't bring the knife with the plan to murder, she had time to decide what she was going to do on the drive over. It's not like it was a quick snap, you know? Ooh, I actually, no, I didn't snap. I can't snap. It just seems a little like, I don't know. I don't know where I land on that. Apparently the judge and Bernadette's attorney thought that the trial was all relatively pointless at the end of it all because apparently weeks before the trial, Bernadette had agreed to plead guilty to second degree murder and the prosecution had denied it. So the judge and Bernadette's attorney kind of thought the whole trial was just for entertainment value and to kind of further punish Bernadette. But you know, when Bernadette agreed to plead guilty to the second degree murder charge, the DA rejected it and Kirsten's parents supported the decision to go after the first degree murder charge because they were hoping that she would be convicted of first degree murder. But as we know, that did not happen. The trial lasted for three days and instead of there being a jury because Bernadette was tried as a minor, the, the, uh, the trial was heard just by a judge and that was Judge Edward L. Merrill and the courtroom was packed. There were so many people in there that they were lining the walls. They were trying to sit in each other's laps. There was just so many people there. One, because everybody's nosy as hell. Two, because Kirsten was very popular. Bernadette had people who cared about her too. So all of these people were there and the bailiff often had to kick people out to keep the capacity limit in check. At the end of the trial, Bernadette Prati, who was tried as a minor, was found guilty of second degree murder. She was sentenced to the maximum sentence of nine years in custody in the California Youth Authority and was sent to a maximum security facility near Camarillo, California. She would serve no less than one year and no more than nine. And when she was led from the courtroom, she cried. Kirsten's family was of course devastated by this ruling. It just seemed like such an incredibly light sentencing considering the crime. And Kirsten's mother, Beret, was said to have been mad dogging Bernadette through the whole trial, glaring at her and giving her dirty looks, as I'm sure you can imagine. And after the verdict was read, she said, and I quote, my heart is empty. I ache. I am half a person. She will probably be given her freedom in a few years. I ask the people of California, is this justice? Kirsten's father, Art, said of the verdict, and I quote, I'm not in agreement with the punishment. I am not thrilled or pleased. The trial was good from the standpoint of hearing all the facts and evidence. We've lost our daughter. I don't think the punishment will ever match the crime. The overall response from those who knew Kirsten and Bernadette was, as I'm sure you can imagine, that nine years is not enough. It just seems so incredibly low. And it's kind of crazy, actually, to consider that somebody could kill somebody and get such a low sentence. But she was tried as a minor, which is why it was so low. It just seems... It just seems crazy that the sentence would be so low when what she did was so horrible. And to answer Kirsten's mother as a citizen of California, no, this doesn't feel like justice. Bernadette tried to parole a few times, but finally on June 10th, 1992, when she was 23 years old and after serving only seven years, she did get paroled and was released from prison. She was then released from supervision altogether at the age of 25 and moved out of state with her family. Kirsten's family actually did end up relocating. They left Orinda, California and moved to Hawaii. And when Bernadette was released, they were clearly against her being released. And they just did not feel like the punishment fit the crime, obviously. Seven years for murdering their daughter. I can't imagine how they would be okay, but the parole board went against the family's wishes there. This case was really, really popular at the time that it happened, clearly. I mean, 
rich kid gets killed, that's always, uh, especially when it's done by another child, that's always noteworthy, especially in like a wealthy area, you know, but uh, it was so popular that, as I said, a, a movie was made called The Death of a Cheerleader. It's also called A Friend to Die For. Uh, it depends on where you watch it. I know that's confusing. One is a U.S. title and one's a U.K. title. I think Death of a Cheerleader is the U.S. title, but it follows, you know, the story of the case. It stars Tori Spelling. It's a pretty good, it's not good. It's very Lifetime. The acting's very Lifetime, and don't get me wrong, I love Lifetime movies, but uh, it does follow the case story pretty well, just changing some names and some little things, adding a little bit more of a religious aspect that I didn't find when doing my research, but overall it wasn't a bad watch. So if you wanted to watch it to see a dramatization of this, because some people do really enjoy that, you can find the whole, uh, the whole movie on YouTube. But with that said, that my friends is the story of the murder of Kirsten Kostas, the real life death of a cheerleader. What do you think? I just think it's so sad, dude. I cannot imagine what it's like to lose a child. That seems impossibly sad. And it's just like a horrifying fear, honestly, of mine. Like I can't imagine having kids and something like that happening. It seems, I don't know how anybody goes on and it just seems so stupid and sad and avoidable. And like, I get it. When you're 15, most people at 15 just want nothing more than to be liked and accepted and to just fit in. But it's just such a drastic response to the idea that people might find you odd and not like you. Like, in order to not have that happen, you kill a person. And then even after she did it, and even after she was arrested, asking police, like, what's going to happen and thinking that the shame of people knowing and your reputation being ruined would be worse than prison. Like that just goes to show just how important being liked was to her and just how like important her image was to her. And that's absolutely wild to me. I did read that in that area in general in Arinda, that's kind of just how it was in general, not to the extreme that Bernadette took it, but it was all about appearances and what you had and what you drove and what kind of car you had. So it wasn't an isolated thing to Bernadette, but still it just seems so weird and so far removed from what I would do in response to the same situation. But also, you can't hurt my reputation, baby. Everybody already knows that I'm fucking trash. And back to a serious note, which it's all very serious. I just have to like make light of some things or how could I ever do this long term, you know, but they were both 15 years old, 15 babies literal children and now Kirsten's gone forever and Bernadette's just now out there living her life. Um, I looked into it. She's changed her name. Uh, literally, it takes no effort, barely an inconvenience to go online and find out um, her new name and see what she looks like now. I'll, put, I'll probably put a photo for you, but um, she's just, she seems like she's doing well. She runs a blog now. It's just absolutely crazy. <sighs> I really wonder if she did plan it. I feel like if I'm honest, I sort of lean towards no. I feel more like it was probably a response to the fear of being rejected. I don't know if she went out that night with the intention of murdering her. I just, for some reason, I have trouble believing that. It seems like a pretty drastic plan, but then again, I don't know her. Maybe that's the type of person she was, but I did try to look into it and see if there ever even was an actual party that night because I thought that that, there's cat hair on my face. I thought that could shed some light on my, you know, on what was happening and my opinion could be swayed with that, but I couldn't find anything that said if there actually was a party, which leads me to believe that there was a party because I believe if there wasn't a party, it would have been heavily publicized that she lied about there even being a party to get her out of the house. I feel like that would be noteworthy. So my suspicion based on the evidence and what I've read is that there was a party. So <sighs> it's just crazy and sad, man. I don't know what to tell you, but Anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope that it was interesting and informative and gave you all of the information you would want when looking into this case. And of course, I hope you enjoyed it because I want to put out into the world what I would want to see. And this is something I'd want to see. So I wanted to bring it to you. And of course, thank you for hanging out with me and learning a little bit more about Kirsten today and remembering her with me today because she's obviously very worth remembering. She was such a young girl with so much life ahead of her. And it's so sad to consider somebody that young just being taken from this earth and having no opportunity to even see like what life's all about. You know, it's just, please let me know of any cases you would like to see me cover down below, because clearly this case is evidence that if you leave a suggestion, I add it to my list. I put your name next to it to give you a shout out because I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise you would not be here. 
Of course, make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell because I put out a new morbid makeup video every single week and I'd love to hang out with you. Yes, specifically you. And if you want to follow me on my other social media, I'm most active on Instagram and Twitter, particularly Instagram stories. They're both Brad or Steen, like my namesake here. And I did make a Facebook page and a Facebook group per a request from y'all. I don't say y'all. I don't know why I said that, but uh, I'll put them on the screen here and I'll put everything in the description box if I can remember. So if you want to hang out, we can. I really like talking to you guys online. It's fun. That's why, you know, it's fun. We're friends. And with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That's tight. You're tight. Please stay safe and be nice. Just, just be nice. It's, it's not that hard. Be better than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video.